Councillors, please stand. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here today to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make here today. Amen. Amen. Brisbane City Council acknowledges this country and its tra traditional custodians. We acknowledge and respect the spiritual relationship between the traditional custodians and this country which has inspired language, song, dance, law, and dreaming stories over many thousands of years. We pay our respects to elders, those who have passed into the dreaming, those here today, those of tomorrow. May we continue to peacefully walk together in gratitude, respect, and kindness in caring for this country and one another. Please be seated, councillors. I declare the meeting open. Councillor Hutton, do we have any apologies? Uh, Chair, I'd like to advise that Councillor Johnson will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Thank you. It has been moved by Councillor Hutton and seconded by Councillor Jenkinson that Councillor Johnson be granted a leave of absence for today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Apologies, Chair. I move that um, Councillor Marks will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence from this meeting. Noted. We will also seconded. Thank you. It's been moved by Councillor Hutton and seconded by Councillor Jenkinson that Councillor Marks also be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much. I wish to advise Councillor Griffiths will be away for today's meeting and move that he be granted a leave of absence. Seconded. Thank you. It is moved been moved by Councillor Cassidy and seconded by Councillor Collier that Councillor Griffiths be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Hutton, can I have confirmation of minutes, please? Sure, Chair. I move that the minutes of the 4,725th meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Hutton and seconded by Councillor Jenkinson that the minute of the 4,725th meeting of Council held on the 31st of October 2023 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we move into question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Civic Cabinet Chair of any standing committee? Councillor Owen. the Chair of the Transport Committee, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, Brisbane is the fastest growing capital city in the country and now is the time to be building better public transport and readying ourselves for more services. Can you please update the Chamber on the latest in Brisbane's public transport services? Councillor Murphy. Thank you, uh, Chair, and through you, uh, thank you to Councillor Owen for the question. And I'm happy to share with Councillor Owen that construction on our new Brisbane Metro depot at Rochdale is almost complete. Yes, out at Rochdale, Chair, we are building what will become Australia's largest electric bus depot. A state-of-the-art facility set across 10 hectares with space for 100 metros to be stabled, charged and maintained. We are the only bus operator in the country that is building a depot of this size and scale. And it's only possible because of the commitment that this Lord Mayor and the Schrinner Council have made to public transport in this city. Compare and contrast this to the state government who many years ago announced lofty targets for bus electrification, but to date they haven't electrified a single depot. I have no doubt, Chair, that we will have conceptualised, designed, constructed and commissioned our Metro depot all before Minister Bailey makes any meaningful progress on zero emissions buses for Queensland residents. Chair, just like Without a Fight did in the Melbourne Cup just before, it is the Schrinner Council who will be crossing the finish line first. Now, while they are tinkering, we've been hard at work getting on with the job of transitioning our public transport to zero emissions with Brisbane Metro. I was out on site at Rochdale this morning with my good friend, Councillor Huang, and I'm still struck by the massive scale of this endeavour every time I go. 
We've installed 500 tonnes of structural steel, 25 kilometres of in-ground cabling and 31,000 square metres of concrete pavement. Rochdale will be our first fully electric depot and our biggest, but it will also be our most sustainable depot. Over 2,000 solar panels will generate one megawatt of electricity to help power our metros and contribute to the site's five green star rating. Over the next few months, we'll be putting the finishing touches on the depot and the timing couldn't be better, Chair, because the first production metros will be here by the end of the year. Rochdale won't only be home to our new fleet chair, it will also be home to a new generation of bus drivers. We have thousands of bus drivers employed with Council who deliver 10,000 trips every day, which is no mean feat, but we have to keep in mind metros will run every five minutes during the peak and they'll run 24-7. So in the lead up to metro services commencing, we, we will need to continue to bolster our workforce in preparation. Now that's no easy task, Chair, because we know in the last few years the public tra transport sector from around the world has faced significant challenges with bus driver recruitment and retention. Um, but at the first sign of bus driver shortages here in Brisbane, we launched a major campaign to employ new bus drivers. I'm pleased to advise the Chamber that we've now employed over 400 new drivers which have entered the training school this year, which is a massive uplift on our usual intake and we are expecting to hit 500 new bus drivers by the end of this year. And we're seeing the benefits, Chair. More bus drivers means more reliability in our network. Thanks to our recruitment drive, our service reliability is now topping out at 99.8 per cent. Um, that makes us the second most reliable public transport offering in the entire country, only behind the Sydney Metro, which is autonomous uh, chair, so pretty highly reliable. So across all fronts, there is great cause for optimism in Brisbane at the moment, and uh, unfortunately, the only ones who aren't on board are the Labor opposition. Just in Transport Committee this morning, we heard uh, Councillor Cassidy suggest that he talks to bus drivers all the time and that morale in transport for Brisbane is low. Well, we know that Councillor Cassidy does talk a lot to the paid RTBU officials and organisers, but he clearly hasn't been talking to bus drivers, because I was talking to some bus drivers this morning at Rochdale, and they could not be more excited to be part of the future decarbonisation of the city's transport network. They couldn't be more excited to be part of the journey that we are undertaking. That excitement is palpable, and I've got to say, morale has never been higher. And the proof is in the pudding, because if morale was low, then why would bus drivers be flocking to us by the hundreds? So while Councillor Cassidy continues to shill for Labor's biggest and only donor, the RTBU, on that side of the chamber, under the leadership of the Lord Mayor, we will continue to transform public transport in this city for the better. And if you want to know, Chair, where morale is really bad, you only have to look at the other side of the chamber, because we know that come March 17th, Councillor Cassidy won't have any cause for celebration. And in fact, Chair, I think the Councillor Clag truck will be Murphy, rocking up to Peel Street to pick up Councillor Cassidy expired. and his mates. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, you still won't come clean and admit that council employees are losing their jobs and the impact that's having on them. Employees in public space operations have told me, and I quote, my concerns are that the majority of this casual labour was filling FTE positions that BCC haven't actively recruited or filled. So in a roundabout way, they are actually making positions redundant. So Lord Mayor, will you admit today that sacking council staff and trying to cover it up was a mistake and that it will affect council service delivery? Lord Mayor. I'll absolutely admit that we're making sensible savings to keep rates low. Uh, I restate again that if we don't make these savings now, then by the end of uh, this financial year and the middle of next year, uh, there will be a significant financial challenge with the cost pressures on this council. Just like there's cost pressures on the state government, just like there's cost pressures on the federal government we're hearing about, they're trying to shed a whole heap of projects. They've been, uh, they've been talking about this in recent days. Uh, just like there's cost pressures on business and just like there's cost pressures on family household budgets, everyone is facing these cost challenges. Now, you can bury your head in the sand 
and you can hope that this will go away, which is the Labor approach, in the end, that means that ratepayers would have to pay more. We don't take action now. And so by finding 10% savings across the budget, across in a sensible way, across uh, what is a $4 billion budget or $4.3 billion budget, we can then keep the pressure on rates low. We've been really upfront about this. We have uh, seen just in recent days uh, the Federal Treasurer talking about exactly this, the need to reduce costs at the federal level. The Labor Federal Treasurer has been talking about it right now, uh, yesterday, today, and continues to talk about it. We see uh, research that was done on a nationwide level, which asked people, what do you think the federal government should do to address inflationary and cost pressures that are on people at the moment? And you know what one of the top things was, Mr Chair, that people suggested? Reductions in government spending. 77% of people in that survey said that government spending should be reduced. That is at the federal level. And I have no doubt it is no different at the council level or at the state level. People understand. They understand because they're facing the same pressures in their own budget. And so we've been really upfront. We need to find these savings. We need to find them in a sensible way uh, that puts downward pressure on rates because the alternative is higher rates under a Green Labor coalition of chaos. That is the reality. Now, uh, when it comes to the other alternatives, taxation increases or rates increases, we've seen the Green Labor Coalition of Chaos announce three new taxes in three weeks. Three new taxes in three weeks. That is quite clearly their solution to every problem, a new tax. If there's a problem that arises, they propose a new tax. If there's a crisis that arises, new tax will fix it. We know that that is not the case. We know that in the end it just means that people pay more. It means that ratepayers pay more. It means that renters will pay more because of the crazy Greens policy that was announced just yesterday. Renters will pay more. We know that under Labor and the Greens, renters will pay more, householders will pay more, ratepayers will pay more, and we're working really hard to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, in terms of council staff, we've heard uh, ongoing for weeks and weeks, uh, mistruths being peddled um, by uh, Labor and opposition councillors. They claimed that uh, bus drivers were under threat. When we've just heard today, we've employed more than 400 new bus drivers. You cannot believe what they say. They claim that library staff were under threat. And once again, it's been confirmed, there are no casual workers in our libraries. They are ongoing council staff. And so when they make claims, you have to take it with a grain of salt because time and time again, they've been making false claims. And so, you know, just even in the suggestion that was put forward, uh, if there's a job vacancy that exists right now and we choose not to fill it, is someone getting sacked? No, it's a vacant position. And I think it's a sensible thing to do to reassess whether someone extra is brought online or whether we can make some sensible savings in that area. That's a sensible way of doing things, but the claim that was made by Councillor Cassidy doesn't marry up with the facts of what's happening. And so we'll continue to look for sensible savings. Uh, we're going through the process because it's all about keeping pressure on rates down. It's about cost of living relief so that we can make sure that people are paying less rather than more under a Green Labor coalition of chaos. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Chair of uh, Finance and City Governance Committee, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cunningham, the Greens Labor Coalition of Chaos have been blatant in making things up when it comes to council staff. Can you please confirm once again what our sensible savings aim to achieve? Councillor Cunningham, you've got the call. Thanks, Mr Chair, and thanks to Councillor Huang for the question. Mr Chair, with costs rising across the board, governments have a very clear choice between reducing spending or increasing taxes and charges on residents in the middle of a cost of living crisis. The choice that this administration has made is the obvious one, 
and we know that residents support governments reducing spending to help curb inflation. Because, Mr Chair, we're undertaking the sensible savings now to keep rates low. We've been very clear from day one that no permanent council staff will be impacted as a result of these changes. When it comes to casuals, Mr Chair, the claims made by both Labor and Green councillors have shown to be incredibly misleading, and they're usually based on entirely false premises. We've had Labor councillors saying our casual bus drivers were at risk, despite the Lord Mayor very clearly saying that our bus services will not change in this city. And as the Lord Mayor has just said, not only are we seeing no reduction in bus driver numbers, we've just announced 442 new recruits that have come on board this year alone. We've heard Councillor Collier and Councillor Massey make false claims that library casuals were at risk, even though we don't have casuals in our libraries branch. Moving on to the opposition claims that some casual staff were allegedly terminated due to the sensible savings plan. You see, Mr Chair, casual work has always been based on demand and shift availability. However, casual contracts remain in place for the term of the contract. We know that in one particular council branch, discussions were had with a small group of three non-frontline casual staff before the Lord Mayor's announcement that due to normal workforce factors, shift availability would soon be changing. And then, as had been previously discussed, shift availability for the time being was no longer there, not because of savings needed to be found, but in fact because there was no work to do. None of those staff were terminated, Mr Chair. Their contracts, in fact, remain. And what's more, one of those staff members even got offered a new contract, but they didn't accept the offer, which is entirely up to them and which is, they are entitled, entirely entitled to do. So, Mr Chair, for all the breathless exaggeration from those opposite here in the chamber, the facts on casuals are this. Listen up. A grand total of zero, that's zero, Council casuals have been terminated for the reasons purported by the opposition in the past three weeks. According to payroll records, we've seen three voluntary resignations, one case where a worker was unable to commence due to failing to obtain the necessary requirements to undertake that particular job, and one case, Mr Chair, where the worker actually never started. I was very hesitant to go into this level of detail, but when the opposition continuously make these false claims, it must be called out, yeah. Mr Chair. If the opposition had specific information contrary to this, they could of course write to me on a confidential basis so that it could be investigated, but if not, Mr Chair, they're simply mischief making. As for contractors, consultants and contingent staff, yes, these arrangements are being reviewed and discussed with the relevant parties, including our unions, Mr Chair. And it's entirely consistent with what governments do at all levels, all of the time. In 2020, Cameron Dick announced his plan to save $750 million, which included, quote, reducing the use of consultancies and contractors by government with a view to ending arrangements where possible. In this year's Victorian budget, the Labor government announced that, quote, further savings will be achieved through reductions in labour hire and consultancy expenditure. This formed part of a $3.6 billion efficiencies plan, Mr Chair. While we look to find sensible savings to Councillor keep rates Cunningham, low... your time has expired. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, I have a message from Library Services staff I'd like to read to you and for you to answer a question that they have. And this is what they had to say. We are super busy in Library Services, but have been told there will be no new recruitments for some time. 
Staff are still expected to run events and run a library when we are understaffed. There is talk of cutting numbers of staff to work on Sundays. This is unfair on staff working the shift due to not enough staff and also to those wanting to work more Sundays to boost their income. It's all bad news. So, Lord Mayor, do you concede that your announcement to cut $400 million from the budget is going to hurt council employees more than you have previously said it would? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. All, all of our staff do a fantastic job. And uh, all of our staff are busy. I would, I would certainly expect that they would be busy. And as we've heard from Councillor Cunningham, if there's no work to do, uh, then we tend not to employ staff to do no work. And so areas that are busy right across the organisation uh, is our expectation. Uh, we are all busy. Our staff are busy. They do a fantastic job. And they do it because they're passionate about Brisbane, uh, just like we are. When it comes to library services, it's interesting. The only the, the, the critical thing that I heard out of that is that there is talk about changes. There is talk about changes. Well, the only people that are talking about changes are the Labor and Green councillors. They're the ones that are talking about the changes causing concern. Uh, and I'm not aware of any changes to library staff. I'm not aware of anything. And so if there's talk about it, then I, I think the Labor and opposition councillors should have a good hard look at themselves because they're the ones that are causing concern. Uh, and they should be ashamed of themselves because they used to be the party that cared for workers. Uh, and now we know, yeah, that's long since gone. That is long since gone. And so there, if there's concern, then the Labor Party should stop fanning the flames uh, and they should actually uh, listen in question time when it's confirmed that uh, you know details about library staff have been that they've asked questions about have been confirmed not to be the case. Details about bus drivers have been confirmed not to be the case. And so, really, the you know if the questions about there's talk, uh, well, the best way to calm that down is to stop spreading mistruths, Mr Chair. Further questions? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, Brisbane's momentum as a city has once again made international headlines. Can you please update the Chamber on the latest endorsement of our fantastic River City? Deputy Mayor, you've got the call. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Hutton. And we have known for many, many years in this place that Brisbane is absolutely the best place to live, work and play. But the rest of the world have finally opened their eyes and realising as well. For the first time, magazine's top 50 greatest places, now renowned travel publication from its best places to visit for 2024. As I said, it's been fantastic um, for us, for people to finally realise and recognise that it's also about time that people realise we are a wonderful city to visit. And it's no accident, can I say, Brisbane is the fastest growing capital, in the, uh, capital city in the country, with people from all over Australia and around the world recognising that our city's incredible climate, lifestyle and livability is absolutely second to none. In the lead up to 2032, we will use the gift of the Games to introduce the world to the incredible capabilities and communities we have in Brisbane. And the exposure that comes with being a host city is absolutely priceless. Just to be mentioned in the same breath as Paris and LA, and until recently it was Tokyo, Paris, LA, Brisbane, um, it's elevated our city to a whole new level. When we're announced as the host city uh, in 2021, we know that the Google search on Brisbane went through the roof in the first 24 hours. And look, we'll admit it, that was the rest of the world going, where the heck is Brisbane? But that was the whole point. They may not know where we were then, but they are now and they're having a look and they're realising, hey, it's a pretty sexy city to go and visit. I wouldn't mind going and see what's going on as well. And we know the more people that visit, they will know our name, and they will invest here. 
And we're already going about it the right way. In the last few months, it is clear that Brisbane is setting the pace in Australia and around the world. As I mentioned, it started with the Time magazines being named one of the world's top places to visit. And I might add, Brisbane was the only Australian city to make that list in the Time magazine. And that was seen by more than 20 million subscribers worldwide for Time. No doubt hearing about how wonderful we are. But as a destination, Brisbane offers the best of Australia. We're the most Australian city, Lord Mayor. I've heard you say it before. We have vibrant precincts across our cities and suburbs. We have world-class dining. We have diverse cultural experience. And of course, we have the breathtaking natural wonders of beaches to rainforests to deserts and everything in between. But perhaps most importantly, we know as local councillors that it's our friendly and welcoming residents that make us such an appealing place to live and visit. Brisbane is also ranked the top Australian city and 15th in the world of sporting cities. Not just because we're great at hosting sporting events, but it's our grassroots community level sports that we live and breathe in Brisbane as well. Our, our local sports clubs are the lifeblood of our communities. Again, as every local councillor knows, we are the earliest rising city in the world and the morning buzz is full of people enjoying our renowned outdoor lifestyle. That does not mean we don't have a solid reason to get some daylight savings happening as well <laughs> in our capital city. We have made headlines across the world for our dedication to sustainability, having recently been awarded gold level by the UN Habitat under the SDG Gold Cities Initiative. And just recently, we received the Global Award for Sustainable Development in Cities at the Shanghai Global Cities Conference. That's right, Brisbane is now recognised as one of the most sustainable cities in the world. We are the most small business friendly city in Australia and you, I'm just saying the world because that makes us the most in the southern hemisphere so contest me if it's not the world as well. And you only have to look at the calibre of the businesses that were recognised during the Lord Mayor's Business Awards to see that Brisbane's future is so bright in this space. We have overtaken Sydney as the top destination of choice for international small and medium enterprises to travel to Australia. It's called Bleisure. So Bleisure, travel. So when you're doing business and leisure, we are the top pleasure capital in Australia as well. There is more to do than just having fun here. You can also do your business. We have a packed major events calendar. FIFA Women's World Cup, of course, we had. We've got NRL Magic Round coming back. The Brisbane International coming back in, uh, in January. We just finished the Queensland PGA with a course record, and we welcome the Australian PGA at the end of this month as well. That is real economic dividends for our city. We're experiencing a resurgence in international visitors, and it's all been under the leadership of this council, with Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner at the helm. Brisbane Deputy just Mayor, keeps getting better. Your time has expired. And the world agrees. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, you'd be aware that in PSO Green Space there are 78 casual labour hire staff, of which 30 have been let go since you announced your budget cuts. Uh, here's a message from one of the staff members in PSO Natural Environment. We were identified as being a highest threat of suicide and burnout in our work area and w rapidly employed more staff to help with that workload. Now with removing casual staff, we'll, this will put us back to where we were. So Lord Mayor, why have you put your political narrative ahead of the wellbeing and safety of council employees? Lord Mayor. Well, that's an appalling and outrageous claim Absolutely. that's being made. Um, I reject it wholeheartedly. Uh, and uh, look, I mean, Ca Councillor Cassidy can produce all of the statements that he likes, uh, but in the end, we have to find sensible savings to keep rates down for residents. Um, and we've been very clear on how that's going to happen. And we know that uh, Councillor Cassidy. Just one moment, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cassidy, we're not going to call out across the chamber. We are to listen to questions and answers in silence. Lord Mayor. Uh, we know that Councillor Cassidy uh, is opposed to sensible savings, which means that he must be supportive of higher rates and taxes. Uh, and that is a shame, 
Look, in the end, that is his position. He's entitled to have that position. We have a different position. Further questions? Councillor Landers. My question is to the Chair of the Community, Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, this year's Valley Fiesta has now drawn to a close. Can you please update the Chamber on the success of this fiesta, including how it supports Brisbane's nighttime economy and artists? Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, I thank Councillor Landers for the question. The Shrina Council's free and affordable events calendar is practically bursting at the seams this summer. Uh, Valley Fiesta is just one example of how the Shrina Council is creating more to see and do for residents and visitors of Brisbane, and doing so in a way that makes it possible for everyone to enjoy what's on offer, no matter what their budget. Purse strings are tight at the moment, with the cost of living crunching down on households right across the nation. Uh, but the Shrina Council is here to make sure that that doesn't stop you from enjoying the best of Brisbane's music scene. And that is why I was proud to join the team in opening Valley Fiesta on Friday at the King Street Food Fiesta with an all-ages event to kick off Brisbane's biggest annual party. It did try to rain on our parade, but we saw the rain off. And uh, I think for as long as I can remember, it's always done a little bit of uh, raining on Valley Fiesta, but it does not stop the party. The 26th annual Valley Fiesta was not only totally free, the Schrinner Council has also worked hard to make sure that it was accessible and inclusive for all, with Auslan interpreted performances to wheelchair accessible spaces so that everyone was able to experience the thrill of live music without barriers. So I'd like to pay a special thank you to Spinal Life Australia for working with us again this year to achieve this, and so too for all the other incredible work that Spinal Life Australia does on a day-to-day -day basis year-round. To kick things off with a bang on Friday night, we had live music from Brisbane's best up-and-coming artists, including the ever-talented Tai to Uga, I hope I got that right, who is the talking high chief for his Samoan village and an artist who creates and weaves culture through his fresh fusion of electronic dance music, hip hop reggae, beatbox loop machine and traditional instruments. So um, it, this was just one of the reasons why I love the city so much. They have so many talented artists representing and celebrating their cultures in their own unique way. We also had performances from Lucy Courts, the 2022 Cube Effect alumni, and the Lord Mayor's Live Event Award winner. Lucy started the proceedings up in um, King Street, and it was fantastic to see uh, the crowd assembling to hear this wonderful young artist as she performed for us. We also had our homegrown Australian Maori producer, Cusco, dropping the beat with spacious synths and broken percussion, percussion rhythms. And boy, oh boy, what a soundtrack that was to kick off the 26th Valley Fiesta. So no matter whether you're a regular Valley visitor or seeing it for the very first time, the Valley continues to deliver musical memories to last a lifetime. And Valley Fiesta allows us to do that free of charge. For, for more than 25 years now, Valley Fiesta has been captivating audiences and contributing to our incredible local music scene. Last year, we had more than 115 events across 24 venues, showcasing 63 performers, which saw more than 400,000 music fans turn up to enjoy in the, the free festivities. This year, we had another huge lineup of artists and headliners, including Mallrat, Midlife and Hatchie, along with a tonne of local acts. So I want to thank the Tivoli for curating the epic lineup of live acts, um, including Skeleton, First Beige, uh, Jaybird Burn, and the list goes on. And thank you also to Quiver for programming a blockbuster DJ lineup, including David Versace, Greer, Jimmy Ellis, and so many more. Again, everyone was able to enjoy this massive lineup entirely for free. And what's more, it's what we did to make it all inclusive and accessible. The Shrinner Council is proud to lead Australia's most inclusive city, and the team went above and beyond again this year in making sure that the Valley Fiesta offered a space for all residents and to enjoy what Brisbane has to offer. 
Festivals like Valley Fiesta contribute to our vibrant and creative city, providing more to see and do and smile about while supporting our arts and events industry. A massive thank you to all those involved in bringing this year's program to life. Valley Fiesta is just another event in our amazing city that makes it an even better place to live, and another reason why I'm extremely proud to be part of the Schrinner Council. Just one of the ways that we're achieving and making um, what's fun that, that continues year round. We have events and festivities for all ages. So whether it's going to be from guided work, walks through decades old tree giants at Sherwood Arboretum to the bright lights and festive sounds of the Lord Mayor's Christmas carols, Valley Fiesta just fits into that social calendar that makes so much more to see and do right across Brisbane. So we've got loads on offer for families to keep everyone happy over the holidays and we're also... Councillor Howard, I'm sorry Thank your you. time has expired. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, following your announcement of $400 million in cuts 21 days ago, staff and basic services have suffered. PPI have been asked to let go of any casuals and everyone that's on higher secondment are to move back to their substantive position. Uh, the message was that PPI staff also needed to reduce their service level across the city by stopping doing program maintenance and to undertake a triage response to maintenance. Isn't this more evidence that your decisions have affected basic service delivery in the suburbs of Brisbane? Lord Mayor. <clears throat> When uh, we made the announcement on the sensible savings and the 10 per cent reduction across the uh, organisation, we made it really clear that permanent staff would not be impacted, but casual staff would be. Yeah. It was very clear. And so I'm not sure why Councillor Cassidy is surprised about this. It, th there should be no surprise. We were up front right from day one. Um, and so this is a measured way of doing it. And the nature of casual employment is that it is cyclical. Uh, it, is, it is not a permanent ongoing arrangement. It is based on needs. And right now, uh, the needs and requirements of the organisation have changed because we need to focus on keeping rates down for the people of Brisbane. Uh, just like the needs of the federal government are changing when they're looking at shedding large infrastructure projects right across the nation. They need to find $33 billion worth of reductions uh, according to the latest figures. And so I wonder if Councillor Cassidy will be railing against that, uh, because I remember having some debates in this place uh, where we were ringing the alarm bells on this infrastructure review and they were saying, nothing to see here. To see. And now suddenly uh, their factional leader, um, the Treasurer, um, is throwing his toys out of the cot because what we've been saying for months has come true. Uh, but the reality is, Every level of government is under pressure. Every business is under pressure. Every household is under pressure. There's no magic pudding here. And the only magic pudding that Labor comes up with is taxing people more, charging people more rates. And we don't want to do that. We want to keep the pressure on rates low. And so I will keep repeating this while Councillor Cassidy keeps asking the same questions. Uh, the reality is, though, that we've seen, it's interesting, we, you know, I um, explained to my kids the story of the boy who cried wolf. And I remember, you know, for the four and a half years that I've been as Lord Mayor, every single week, Councillor Cassidy has made claims about reductions in council services and a lack of spending in the suburbs. Every single week. <laughs> and. And Councillor Collier, he's been caught out time Councillor and time Cassidy. again, misleading people. Just one moment, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cassidy, please refrain from calling out, Lord Mayor. And so he's undermined his own credibility so badly over the years by spreading so many mistruths. Uh, it is a real shame because, in the end, we've been absolutely upfront here. It's the opposite to the Labor approach. They continue to spread mistruths, even today. They, they continue uh, to make false claims, just like they have been doing for years. Just like they have been doing for years. Uh, and 
If the residents of Brisbane want to know what will happen going forward, I can tell you 90% of what we normally do will still keep happening. But there will be a 10% reduction in spending. And as I said, we've been really upfront about it. Is this, is this a permanent thing? No, it's the right thing to do right now while everyone is under pressure. Uh, will there be changes in the future if situations improve? Absolutely. But that is what households have to do. That is what the other, other levels of government will have to do too. That is what businesses will have to do. And so uh, we are making the responsible and sensible changes now to make sure that we protect the ratepayers in Brisbane. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further questions? Councillor Jenkinson. Mr Chair, my question is to the Chair of City Planning and Suburban Renewal Program, Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen, the Shrinan Council's Village Precinct Project projects is all about supporting small business and creating a city of neighbourhoods. Can you please update the Chamber on the latest in this program of works? Councillor Allen, you've got the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you I thank Councillor Jenkinson for the question. We're investing more than $10 million over four years to revamp our iconic neighbourhood centres right across the suburbs through the village precinct projects. Earlier this year, we completed the 21st village precinct project with the completion of Lumley Street, Upper Mount Cravat, and Sandgate Road, Boondall. We are unashamedly about making Brisbane suburbs even better, which is why 87% of the council's budget is dedicated to building better infrastructure and delivering better services to our suburbs. We are committed to improving the suburbs that make our city so great, and the village precincts projects are part of this. From Cooparoo, Camp Hill and the Corso, to Paddington, Milton and Boondall, to the beautiful Bayside Village in Manly Harbour. We're breathing new life into these local hubs that have been part of the fabric of the Brisbane community for generations. And the timing could not have been better, with more people staying close to home, shopping locally and supporting small business. Businesses excited about the new opportunities these improvements have created, including more outdoor dining areas and places to stop and linger, a far more comfortable environment for all. It's a busy period at the moment with numerous projects underway and at different stages of completion. I'm delighted to inform the Chamber that Park Road Milton Village Precinct project has now completed. At that site, the Park Road street furniture was refreshed, including three new multi-bike racks and the removal of the ageing wayfinding signage. We are also creating a streetscape plaza at the corner of Park Road and Gordon Street to encourage visitors to Adam Smitty Park. These works include floating precast coloured concrete platforms with integrated LED lighting, new pavement to the street corner of the plaza, new water drinking fountains and a new shade, a new shade trees, garden beds and landscaping. And I understand Councillor Jenkinson also hosted an event recently to celebrate the improvements. It's a credit to the local councillor as the event was well attended with residents enjoying free live theatre, live music, urban sketching, face painting and games in the park. So well done, Councillor Jenkinson. I also heard that the martyr smiling for Smitty riders cycled the river loop before joining the event to remember and celebrate Adam Smitty. Mr Chair, I can also update the chamber that works at Rosalie Village have begun. This project aims to improve and enhance the centre's overall attractiveness. The amenity and safety will also improve, be improved, as will accessibility, and it will certainly identify this key shopping location. The works include improving pedestrian thoroughfares, improved traffic signage at key locations in the precinct, installing new garden beds and additional street trees, installing council standard street furniture, including seats, rubbish bins and bike racks, and commissioning public art to enhance the precinct identity. It's all about making these areas more inviting for local businesses to set up shop or to give a boost to those existing businesses and in turn making it more appealing for residents to visit their local area and buy local. Each project is different with their own quirks and character and that's the whole point. These areas offer a different experience to visiting the major shopping centres or online as popular as these have become in recent years. They are a place to connect with community and support local businesses. Our village precinct projects are much more than just a facelift. 
They're all about kick-starting the local economy and creating a city of vibrant neighbourhoods with liveable places for locals and visitors alike. Mr Chair, this is just one of the ways the Schroener Council is making Brisbane an even better place to live, work and relax. Thank you. And that ends question time. Councillors, we move on to the next item on the agenda, the consideration of committee reports. Point of order, Chair. Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much. I move uh, the suspension of standing orders to enable me to move a motion. Seconded. Uh, we have a suspension of a motion for suspension of standing orders, uh, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Collier. Councillor Cassidy, three minutes uh, to the reasons why it was sub not submitted before one o'clock yesterday. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Chair. And the motion uh, of which, if um, standing orders are suspended, I'd like to move is that the Lord Mayor apologise to staff for increasing stress and workload and eroding Council's zero-harm policies through his political decisions and reverse all job cuts. Uh, this morning I received messages from staff including the following. Anyone without a permanent position is likely to lose it. Current staff are burnt out from covering shifts and it looks like positions will not be filled. Another one I received today, PSO Natural Environment was identified as being a high threat of suicide and burnout, something the Lord Mayor just Sorry dismissed just, just, in question just, time. Just one Lord. moment, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Murphy, just give me one second. Um, Councillor Cassidy, this was to the reasons why you or a member of your team could not submit the motion before one o'clock, Deputy Mayor, please, before one o'clock yesterday. Now, just before you carry on, Councillor Murphy, you were rising on a point of order. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. So during question time, the Lord Mayor dismissed these concerns summarily. Um, that work area said more staff were recruited to address those issues, and now those issues are going to arise all over again because of this Lord Mayor's political decisions. Uh, we've heard as well uh, in question time, and I heard today, that 30 casual um, uh, positions in PSO Green Space have been let go. We had about half an hour ago the Chair of the Finance Committee saying that it was only three casuals that were no longer employed by Council and then, and then about 15 minutes later the Lord Mayor gets up and says, well that's right, every casual in Council might go. Uh, so they're not coordinating their Point lines, are they, Chair? Just one moment, Councillor Cassidy. Lord Mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Thank you. Um, so it's a pretty. Hang on, Councillor Cassie. I'll give you the call in a second. Councillor Cassie. Thanks very much, Chair. So the Lord Mayor's political decisions are eroding service delivery and they are harming council workers. I suppose the question is does the LNP even care anymore? Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Lord Mayor, order, Chair. Just one moment, please. Mm -hmm. um, you, can you turn your mic off and resume your seat, please, Councillor Whitby? Lord Mayor, your misrepresentation. Uh, Councillor Cassidy uh, suggested that I'd said every single casual, casual staff member would go. I did not say such a thing. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Whitby, your point of order? No? OK. We will now put the motion. It is a procedural motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Collier. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Clerks, please ring the bells. Pleasure. Clerk, councillors, bit of quiet, please, during division. Clerks, please read the results. Mr. Chairman, those have it, the voting being five in favour and eight, 18 against. The procedural motion has not passed. Councillors, please resume your seats.
We'll now move back to the consideration of committee reports. Lord Mayor, Establishment and Coordination Committee report, please. Mr Chair, I move the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday 30th of October 2023 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday the 30th of October 2023 be adopted. Lord Mayor, you've got the call. Uh, Mr Chair, before I move on to uh, the items in front of us, um, you know, we hear continual mistruths being peddled, and today we've just heard another one. Uh, the claim was made by Councillor Cassidy that uh, there were around 30 casual council workers that were let go. And what, in fact, just one moment, Lord Mayor. Yep. Councillor Strunk, no calling out across the chamber. It was clearly heard from up here. Thank you. There's no calling out across the chamber. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, what in fact has happened is that there were 29 agency staff who were told that we no longer require them to do work for council. They're not council employees. They're not council casuals. They, in fact, were employed by an agency. And the nature of that agency work, as Councillor Cassidy should well know, is that we get them to supplement our workforce on a cyclical basis. There's no guarantee of ongoing work for Council. Uh, there are periods where we require agency staff and then there are periods where we don't. And they've been advised that there's no work at this point in time. They are not Council staff. They are not Council casuals. They are, in fact, agency staff. And this is where I go back to the boy who cried wolf uh, analogy, because you know, look, if, if Councillor Cassidy wants to oppose sensible savings, he can do so. That is his right. But stick to the facts. Stick to the facts. That's fine. If you Point want of order. To... Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Murphy. Uh, will the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, are you happy to take a question from oh, Councillor Murphy? I'm not sure if I will. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy, please continue. Uh, thanks, Chair. Lord, Lord Mayor, has Councillor Cassidy not also in this chamber, in this term, opposed the employment of agency staff doing council work? Lord Mayor. You have a really good memory, uh, Councillor Murphy. In fact, um, he has. He's been on the record time and time again uh, in opposing the use of agency staff. And when we stop using agency staff in this case, he's against that too. And that's what I was saying, like stick to the facts. Like, you know, we can have the debate by all means. You can argue for higher taxes and rates. We'll argue for lower spending. Let's have the debate, but stick to the facts. Stop spreading mistruths. Stop uh, concerning uh, council workers unnecessarily. Let, let's, ha let's have an upfront debate about the pros and cons of both approaches. You can try and justify higher rates. We know that Labor's record was... Councillor Cassidy. Just was, one moment, Lord Mayor. Yeah. Councillor Cassidy, it's three times now I've called you out for not remaining quiet. It is a chamber of robust debate, but you are not debating. You are heckling from the sideline. Lord Mayor, you've got the call. Just one moment, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Hammond. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy, I consider that you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with section 21.4 of the Meetings Local Law 2001. I hereby request that you refrain from speaking loudly across the chamber unless you have the call. Lord Mayor, you've got the call. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, look, Councillor Cassidy All whispering, is welcome. Councillor Cassidy, out loudly. You've got the call, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Cassidy is welcome to explain why higher rates would be a better option than reducing spending. He is welcome to make that case. Uh, and certainly because of their record in this place, and I know they, they selectively like to talk about Jim Sawley, uh, they, they see him as some kind of hero figure, um, but they don't mention... Just they one don't moment, mention. Lord Mayor. Just one moment, please. Councillor Collier, Councillor Whitney. 
we're not calling out across the chamber. Thank you. Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, they don't mention that uh, he was the Lord Mayor that lifted rates 6% or higher on no fewer than four occasions, and certainly not in conditions where there was high inflation. In fact, at the time, there was very low inflation in comparison to what it, what it is today, yet there were four occasions, four budgets, where the rate increase was 6% or higher. That's their hero. That's their mentor. That's who they look up to. And so, look, I, I'm happy to have that debate. Uh, you can, you can justify higher rates for people if, if you know, if you want to explain why the people of Brisbane should vote for a Labor Party that delivers higher rates, you do that. Uh, but we will support sensible savings and spending reductions to keep the pressure on rates down. And it's how we're able to deliver for two budgets in a row a rate increase of less than inflation. A rate increase of less than inflation, uh, and also prior to that, the first rate freeze in 35 years. And so our record is clear. We try absolutely every year to keep rates as low as possible. We also, at the same time, try to build as much as possible as well. And even in these challenging times, we're still delivering more infrastructure uh, in three years than Labor would deliver in a decade. And so uh, we are very clear about what the focus should be, and it should be about building as much as we can while keeping rates low. Uh, it should be about providing uh, the quality of services that people expect, but keeping rates low. Uh, and that's what we'll continue to focus on. In front of us, uh, sorry, uh, going to the usual lighting up of our assets that I uh, update people on. Uh, last night, the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge, City Hall and Radcliffe Place were lit up in orange to support Colour the World Orange Day. Uh, this day focuses on complex regional pain syndrome, which is a uh, prolonged pain that can occur following surgery, trauma, stroke or heart attack. Tonight, the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge and Radcliffe Place will be lit up in green to, su to support Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, runs in November every year. And obviously, we're, ke we're uh, keen once again to support this uh, awareness initiative on Thursday night, the Story Bridge will be lit up in purple for the Queensland Brain Institute's 20th anniversary. Uh, brain disorders account for over 20% of the burden of disease in Australia, and the Institute does amazing work every day uh, at the University of Queensland to help solve and find new solutions and cures for brain-related diseases. Uh, also tonight, our assets will be lit up in purple for the Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust annual Christmas appeal. And um, this is something that both myself and Nina and the trustees of the Charitable Trust, including Councillor Adam Allen, are very passionate about. And uh, something where we know the need uh, continues to grow in the community with cost of living pressures and housing pressures. And so uh, this year's Christmas appeal will be just as important, if not more important, than any year that we've faced. And so we thank the residents who already give generously through their rates. Uh, we thank the donors who support the trust in other ways, and, uh, and there are many of them. Uh, we thank uh, those philanthropists who also donate to the trust, and um, we also are keen to let the wider community know about uh, the great work that the trust is doing in supporting the frontline charities and distributing uh, significant grants each and every year, and we want to do that again in the lead up to Christmas. One of the other things that the Trust uh, does in partnership uh, with Bloomberg Incorporation is uh, the Christmas Toy Drive, where Bloomberg Incorporation uh, supports uh, or provides toys, uh, which are then packaged up for many of the charities across Brisbane who work with children. And uh, these toys are given uh, to families uh, or children in situations where they would maybe receive nothing at Christmas. And so, uh, and so this is a wonderful thing and something that we'll continue to support this year and I would encourage everyone to get involved in supporting the Lord Mayor's Charitable Trust annual Christmas appeal. On Friday and Saturday night, uh, all our assets will be lit up in red for Remembrance Day. Uh, and obviously that marks the anniversary of the armistice that ended the fighting uh, in World War I. It's a highly important day in our national calendar, uh, not only in Australia but 
in other parts of the world as well, uh, and we'll be commemorating uh, Remembrance Day together on Sunday night. Our assets will be lit up in orange again, this time to support cervical cancer awareness. Over 900 women have been diagnosed with cervical cancer this year alone, uh, and the Awareness Week encourages women to look into the forms of protection, including vaccination and screening options. Now, we've all been, uh, I think, grateful to see some much wanted rainfall in yes. recent days, yes. um, given the dry conditions that we've experienced and the concerns about bushfires burning in other parts of Queensland. And so uh, that uh, rainfall is welcome and com it's come at just the right time as well. But having said that, we continue uh, to make sure we are as prepared as possible for what might lay ahead in terms of the season ahead. Uh, it could dry out again quite quickly, and so uh, we continue to prepare. Last week, 13.4 hectares of vegetation uh, works were completed throughout Cannon Hill bushland, Karawatha Forest, Archerfield Wetlands Park, Druvale Drew bushland, uh, Tinchy Tamba Wetlands, Tingalpa Creek Reserve. This week, another 15 hectares uh, is being completed, uh, bringing the year-to-date total of over 2,000 hectares across the city uh, of vegetation works uh, in preparing us for uh, the summer season. Last week, there was also almost five kilometres of track and trail maintenance completed at Colo Bushland Reserve, Prout Road Park in Burbank, JC Trotter Park and Druvale Bushland as well. And the items in front of us, uh, item A, the contracts and tendering report uh, for September 2023. Uh, we see 82 contracts being awarded uh, and um, we see uh, 37, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, I'm reading from the wrong section here, 37 out of the 48 contracts are being awarded to local suppliers, uh, which is 77%, um, but Mayor, overall... your time has expired. Move for an extension, seconded. We have a move for extension, moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hutton. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, in this particular month, 77% of contracts went to local suppliers, but overall across the financial year, uh, we're certainly meeting uh, our target of at least 80% of contracts to be awarded to local suppliers. Uh, and so far, uh, across the year, there's been $431 million worth of contracts awarded to local suppliers in South East Queensland, which is a great outcome. Uh, there's uh, some great contracts coming through, and one that I'm particularly passionate about is the Package 3 of the Sunsafe Suburban Playgrounds Program. Uh, this is one that uh, we announced middle of last year, and so uh, it's, it's geared up. This is Package 3 of the program since it was announced last year. And it was interesting, it was brought to my attention that one of the Labor councillors, and this is the boy who cried wolf story yet again, except it was a girl who cried wolf, uh, claimed that the LNP administration had promised to put shade over playgrounds years ago. Years ago, this was the language used, years ago. It was actually the middle of last year that we announced the multi-year program to put shade over every playground. And so, uh, already we're into package three. We're rolling ahead with this program. And so you cannot trust what they say. You just cannot trust a thing that they say. Time and time again, they're caught out, bending the truth, misrepresenting the facts. So years ago, should have read last year, middle of last year, uh, we started a program to put shade over every playground. And it was a multi-year program. Uh, which we announced at the time. And so we'll continue rolling out shade sales. Uh, the um, uh, the uh, playgrounds right across the city in every ward are being covered. And so uh, look forward to seeing this program continue. It's a great one. Uh, and it's one I think the people of Brisbane appreciate and support too. Uh, we are sadly in Queensland, um, the skin cancer capital of the world. And uh, so, you know, playgrounds are, are places that kids spend a lot of time. And, um, you know, this is a, an important thing at that stage in their life in particular, because getting sunburnt early in life um, can have lifelong ramifications. And so playgrounds are a great place to make sure uh, we have protection. Um, and uh, obviously we're doing our part in that space. Uh, also, as part of these contracts, the installation of high-voltage Brisbane Metro end-of-trip charging facilities, 
uh, and the installation of these charging ports at the Metro Depot is well underway. And the contract also includes uh, charging locations at uh, Ernie's Roundabout in Hurston, uh, which is down near the Royal Brisbane um, uh, Women's Hospital, Countess Street in Petrie Terrace, uh, Sir William McGregor Drive in Dutton Park, uh, which is across the bridge from UQ, uh, and um, those facilities um, are part of this contract. Councillor Murphy was obviously discussing those facilities earlier. Um, incredible technology being used here. Uh, to be able to charge a, a vehicle the size of a Brisbane Metro vehicle in six minutes with a flash charge, you can imagine the amount of energy that goes into that and the technology required. Um, and, and so there's a combination of fast flash charging, six minute charges that allows the vehicles then to get back on the road and then overnight charging at the depot as well um, and slow charging at the depot. So a great, um, a great series of contracts which show that we are as Council Murphy said, leading the way when it comes to electrification in Australia. There is nothing else like this anywhere in Australia. No one is advanced when it comes to uh, building a fully electric uh, depot for up to 100 vehicles down the track. Uh, this, this is an Australia first, it's the largest project of its kind and it's something we should all be proud of. Uh, item B is the lease of Council land to community organisations are seeking council approval to progress with le lease and negotiations with a number of community organisations in accordance with section 217 of the City of Brisbane Regulation 2012. Council cannot enter into a valuable non-current asset contract unless it is first, unless it first invites written tenders for the contract or offers the valuable non-current asset for sale by auction. And so uh, section 226 of the regulation provides a number of exemptions that council may apply to the disposal of an interest in land, <clears throat> other than by way of a tender or auction. Uh, and obviously these are um, community organisation leases that we're talking about, where in most cases the, this is an organisation that has a current lease, and we're talking about a lease renewal or a lease extension, and um, the, uh, the intent here is to have this approval so that we can enter into those lease arrangements and negotiations and finalise the lease for these organisations. So there's 42 organisations operating from council space uh, that we uh, want to seek approval for today to uh, sort those leases out. And once again, I hope uh, we get the support of councillors in this chamber. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy, you've got thanks the call. For, oh, thanks very much, Chair. And can I ask that item A and B uh, be taken seriatim for voting, please. A and B taken seriatim. Noted. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, first of all, on the um, contracts and tendering report for um, September, we're of course at day 21 of this um, LNP Mayor's um, Savage Cuts. $1.6 million a day that is being cut from suburban projects and services, and that'll add up to $400 million in okay. staff cuts, project cuts and cuts to um, services in the suburbs of Brisbane, as we are finally starting to uncover uh, through question time today, the Lord Mayor is finally admitting that he is okay with shedding uh, agency staff, temporary staff that are doing ongoing council work. Uh, so we know that there are over 1,000 temporary contract staff that are working in council. Well, they were uh, up until 21 days ago doing ongoing full-time equivalent work. We know that the LNP administration, led by Councillor Adrian Schrinner, decided to employ temporary, casual labour hire staff to fulfil full-time equivalent positions within Council to do basic ongoing work, uh, whether that's in the public space operations, in maintaining our parks and gardens, whether that's clearing drains out, uh, whether that's um, maintaining memorials in parks, trimming trees, all those sorts of things that you would expect a council to do. People are paying their rates and expecting council services. Uh, it's the basics. It, it is the basics. And what we know is that um, there were, though, there were um, 78 positions point within order, PSO Mr. Green Chief. Space. Just one moment, Councillor Cassidy. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the relevance of the Leader of the Opposition's debate to contracts and tendering and the community organisation leases. He's not allowed to go around the world. Noted. Um, 
Councillor Cassidy, just a reminder that we are to speak on the items before us. So we are, we yeah. are speak, you're speaking on item A. Yeah, thank, yes, thank you, Chair. So thank you. Um, on item A here, we know that we're sort of, we've seen these contracts come through month on month and again before us today for more and more of this basic work to be contracted out and also increasing use of agency labour where they should be permanent full-time employees of Brisbane City Council whose jobs would be safe, even, even under the LNP apparently. Even under the LNP they claim that they wouldn't sack full-time staff, they only sack the thousand staff that work in council on temporary contracts that perform full-time equivalent duties. Bit of contract here, number 17, Chair, contract 17 for quantity surveying and estimating services. Um, that's an important one, and, and, and quantity surveying is an important function that Point council... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. I'm wondering whether Councillor Cassidy will take a question. Councillor Cassidy, would you care to take a question? Yes. Deputy Mayor, Councillor Cassidy would like to hear your question. Uh, my question is if by some bizarre anomaly in the world that the Leader of the Opposition became the Leader of the Administration, would he pay Council staff to do nothing if there was nothing to do on the ground? Councillor Cassidy. Whoa. <laughs> I I'll take, yeah, thank you very much. In answering that question, I will just, I need to just absorb the fact that the Deputy Mayor of Brisbane thinks that there's a whole bunch of council staff sitting around there doing nothing at the moment. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Oh, no, I'll clarify the question. He just said just that on hang on, hang on, stop. stop. Oh, Councillor Cassidy, me. no. Councillor Collier, definitely not. What about the Deputy Mayor? I'm getting around to that. Oh, okay. And Councillor Whitby, no. No speaking until you've been given the call, Deputy Mayor. On no, your... it, was, it was a misrepresentation. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy, you've got the call. Thanks very much, Chair. So the position of the LNP now, uh, and this is on record, is that um, they believe that there's not enough work for the Council workforce to perform. We Point know of order, that Mr. the Chair. list... Just one moment, Councillor Cassidy. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy, you've got well, the call. Well, look, I'll pose a question, and the Deputy Mayor can answer this when um, she gets up to enter the debate on contracts and tendering. Mm -hmm. um, what area of council do you think there are surplus staff at the moment? Oh, I understand. I understand if the LNP cut back on services. If they stop doing maintenance, if they stop clearing drains, they stop doing upgrades, they stop doing park work, they stop resurfacing road, all those sorts of stuff. If the LNP stop projects, I, I understand that there will be less need for staff, but therein lies the problem. That's what this LNP administration is doing. They are cutting services, point of they order, are Mr. cutting Chair. projects. Just one moment, Councillor Cassidy, point of order, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Cassidy's debate has nothing to do with the two items before us in this report. <laughs> Just what, Councillor Collier, you can think it, don't vocalise it, otherwise I will give you a warning. Councillor Cassidy, you had asked the Deputy Mayor to respond to that question in when she when she goes around her world. Are you still providing information for that question, or have yeah, you moved no, back? No, I'm still answering the question. Um, right. So, thank you very much, are Chair. you moving back on to Contract 17? No, I'm answering the question that was posed to me. I don't know. Is there a time limit on questions within debate? Uh, no, no, no. You've yeah. got you've I'm got still answering minutes. the Deputy yep. Mayor's question. Please resume. Thank you. Um, so the LNP are cutting projects in the suburbs. Point of order, Mr. The Chair. The LNP are cutting Just services. Just one moment, Councillor Cassidy. Point of order, Deputy My Mayor. My question was: Would he pay people to do nothing? Councillor Cassidy can accept. C Councillor Cassidy can either answer the question or not. We are not actually in question time. Councillor uh, Cassidy. Thank you very much, Chair. In answering the Deputy Mayor's question, the LNP's position is to cut projects, is to cut council services, and is to sack staff. We know that point they are order, sacking agency just staff, and moment, we know they're just, sacking council just staff. Just one moment, Councillor Cassidy. De point of order, Deputy Claim Mayor. Claim to be misrepresented for third time. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Cassidy, you've got the call. Thank you. So by the Chair of the Finance Committee's admission mm -hmm. that they are, they are sacking um, Council point of order, employees. Mr. Chair. Just and one by moment, oh, Councillor Cassidy. Point of order, Deputy I Mayor. I think it's an act of disorder to not follow your instruction to go back to the report. I did not ask about sackings. 
He has finished answering my question. I ask that you bring him back to the report. Noted. Thank, thank you. Councillor Cassidy, I will draw you back to the report. I believe, uh, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor um, Cassidy. I believe the Deputy Mayor's um, continual interjections and points of order of which you haven't upheld is an act of disorder and ask for your ruling on that. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cassidy. The Deputy Mayor has actually made three points of misrepresentation that I'm assuming that, sh that she will address once you finish speaking. Please continue. You've got the call. Uh, there was a lot more than that, and the record will show. Uh, so, so contract 17 um, for quantity surveying and estimating services. This is a really important thing that this LNP administration can't do um, uh, because they don't employ quantity surveyors within council. They've hollowed out council's engineering ability um, across, across the organisation to be able to manage projects. And we've seen some devastating effects of that. We think back to the $100 million blowout in Kingston Smith Drive because that work wasn't done ahead of the contracts being issued. And an entire company went broke and had to go into liquidation because this administration couldn't manage a project. Maybe if the Victoria Park project had proper quantity surveying done, we wouldn't have seen the blowout from $83 million to $141 million. And perhaps if this LNP administration employed some quantity surveyors, uh, they would have been able to keep the Metro project at $944 million as promised, rather than that blowing out to $1.7 billion. The the list goes on and on and on. But instead of employing people directly to do this work, and to the Deputy Mayor's point earlier, there is work that needs to be done, but instead of employing people to do it, they put them on short-term contracts, and uh, Contract 17 before us today is an example of that one as well. Um, moving on, uh, Chair, to I mean, uh, Contract 18, $30 million for Oh, an IT contract that would that would send shockwaves, shockwaves through every ratepayer's hip pocket when they see a large IT contract being entered into by this Lord Mayor. Uh, this Lord Mayor entered into the contract with Tech One. How much did that cost ratepayers? I think it was a 50, over 50 million dollars in damages for nothing, and we're seeing the LNP administration enter into $30 million uh, worth of IT contracts today. Uh, we are very worried. We are very worried about blowouts on that one because um, all of the IT contracts this LNP administration has entered into have along the way added to the blowouts on this Lord Mayor's watch that have now led to staff sackings, to projects being cancelled and to service delivery suffering in the suburbs of Brisbane. Mm. And we've got another one here, Chair, in um, contract 20 before us today, landscape maintenance services for council facilities. Now, this isn't for, th these are council owned facilities, the council's running, we presume, uh, and this administration, this LNP administration is contracting out that work. So at the same time the Lord Mayor is saying to all of the divisions within council, you have to stop using contractors, to provide work, he's entering into a $5.5 million contract uh, in the schedule of rates to landscape at council-owned facilities. So obviously this work has been planned out. Obviously within council someone has figured out exactly what landscaping needs to be done because when they put the request for tender out, they put those specifications in there. So why don't we employ those people in council? That's ongoing basic work. We, I, know, I know why we don't, because this LNP Mayor, Councillor Schrinner, has made it very clear over the years that he doesn't value permanent ongoing work. He likes to contract things out, even if they are ongoing work. Uh, that's the LNP way. Um, so the mismanagement of this LNP administration is before us. Uh, before us today, before us every day, and the fact that they are sacking staff, putting pressure on um, divisions like library services and PSO green space to stop delivering services and yet entering into more contracts Councilor is inconceivable. Cassidy, I'm sorry, your time has expired. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Move for Collier. an extension. Second. Move for extension for Councillor Cassie. Moved by Councillor Collier. Seconded by Councillor Strunk. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy, you've got the call. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, moving on to the lease of land to um, community organisations. Um, uh, this is 
something we will support, and it's good news for these organisations uh, and important for those um, community organisations, service organisations, sporting clubs um, uh, to have support out in the community to have a lease site. We've been very clear about our concerns around the lack of support after the lease is signed that these organisations get, uh, but we do agree that um, they should enter into leases, so we, we agree with this item before us today. Um, I remember a few years ago the trend, this is when I was back on the Lifestyle and Community Services Committee in a previous term of council, um, we were told the trend was to extend leases beyond the shorter term, um, stop having four-year leases as the default and try to get more and more organisations on ten-year leases so they have uh, more certainty about what they are going to do into the future um, around applying for grants, uh, around saving for the future and providing services. Um, but I, I just don't see that as a reality under this administration. I mean, that was a great idea that came from officers uh, within the division and said that they wanted to see more support, but clearly everywhere we see this, whether it's staff trying to deliver services in libraries or out in the field uh, through PPI or PSO Green Space, those staff are trying to work really hard, but the barrier they are coming up against is this LNP administration. Uh, time and time again, the political leadership of this LNP council is getting in the way. We would all, you know, love to have seen organisations like the Safford Bowls Club um, be awarded to a community organisation and be on this list before us today, um, but you know, those, that community wasn't afforded that opportunity, of course, as we know. Um, we we want to see more investment in community and sporting clubs because as we approach um, the Olympics in 2032, the community benefits should be immense, not just in sporting clubs that are Olympic sports, sporting clubs that aren't Olympic sports, um, community service organisations as well that support the community. Council's role in delivering a legacy for 2032 should be a generational investment in community and sporting clubs. But we just don't see that. We see a business as usual approach from this LNP administration. We see items come through that leases are just rolled over, re signed, the same old conditions are put on um, community organisations, same old, same old, as we keep rolling through the motions of this LNP administration. You, know, you, you understand why. I mean, they've been here for 20 years. Yeah. They've, they've run out of puff, they've run out of ideas, they've run out of energy. Um, uh, and Councillor just... Cassie, can I draw you back to item B, please? Uh, leases to community organisations, yeah, thank you very much, um, mm. Chair. So we know that the support for community organisations that lease off council leaves a lot to be desired. Um, uh, there, there is, there's other councils that have different models. They are not right for a council the size of Brisbane, but there has to be a better way. Mm. There has to be more support for that. And you can't have an organisation that is run on Bunnings barbecues and raffles through a footy season left to try and find three or four hundred thousand dollars to upgrade their change rooms mm. to allow um, female participation because this administration won't dip into the coffers to help them. Mm. I mean they at the same time they look at a council budget that allocates $141 million to the Victoria Park project, but that footy club cannot scrape together enough money to retrofit a 50-year-old building that's owned by council for female change facilities. So something has to change. While the LNP are in charge, nothing will change. Uh, come March next year, there is change coming right around Brisbane. Uh, and there is a choice for people to make, and the business as usual approach we see from this LNP administration, I think, will be tossed out. Thank you, <coughs> Councillor Cassidy. Deputy Chair. Mayor, your three points of misrepresentation, Thank you. please. Sorry, firstly, no, I do not think staff are sitting around doing nothing. Secondly, no, it is not that there is not enough work, but that if there is a contract and the contract for the project is completed, contract workers are released. And thirdly, we are not sacking staff. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there further speakers? <coughs> Councillor Adaman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak briefly in support of item B, where Council is proposing to renew existing leases on land used by community groups for sport, recreation and cultural purposes. 
Three of the organisations that will benefit from today's decision are in my ward, and I'd like to touch briefly on each of them and commend the great work that they're doing locally. They are the Mogul Junior Australian Football Club, the Royal Queensland Lawn Tennis Association and the Scout Association of Queensland. Both the Mogul Junior Football Club, better known as the Mustangs, and the Lawn Tennis Association are based at the Mogul District Sports Park. The decision by the Quirk Liberal Administration, with very strong advocacy by the former Pullen Bale Ward Councillor Margaret DeWitt, to invest in the development of the Mogul District Sports Park showed wonderful foresight at the time, and this facility continues to be a great asset in the Mogul and Belbarry communities. <coughs> Excuse me. Chair, I want to single out the Mogul Mustangs president, um, Matt Kiker, whose family moved from Victoria to the Mogul area a couple of years ago and immediately became involved in the club. <clears throat> like many ex expat Victorians, Matt is passionate about, the Austra about Australian football and is actively promoting children to play the great game. And to pardon the pun, he's kicking some serious goals. Last year, there were 53 participants in Community Auskick. That number grew by 11% in 2023, with 16 of them being young girls. Likewise with superstars, last year there were seven participants. This year there were 28, with 11 of them female. And then in the juniors, the number of participants increased from 33 to 60, an almost 100% increase with the number of teams expanded from three to five. Local businesses are now seeing the benefits of being associated with the Mustangs. From zero sponsors in 2022, they now have eight on board and I expect that number to grow. Chair, likewise with the tennis courts at the Mogul District Sports Park, the Lawn Tennis Association continues to secure strong bookings of the courts, whether it's for schools, competition or social use. Extending that lease will provide continuity, but more important, it is ensuring that large numbers of local residents are playing tennis as part of an active and healthy lifestyle. And finally, the Corona Downs Scout Group, located at Coopy Park, Tendera Way. The scouting movement in Australia began in 1908 and has a proud history of teaching young boys and these days girls a range of skills and disciplines that continue to serve them well through life. Chair, I know that you have a strong association with scouts in your ward, as does Councillor Landers, and I do in ours and my scout supporter scarf hangs proudly in my office, and I'm always happy and available to help my three local scout groups. I was both a cub and scout in my youth, and when I see the scouts of today are able to do, I wish I had paid more attention. <laughs> that said, anything we can do to support what is now the world's largest youth organisation can only be a good thing, and I support this recommendation before us today. Thank you, Councillor Adam, and further speakers. Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Chair. I also rise to speak about item B, and in particular, the support for my local community groups, the Tingalpa Model Aero Club and the Balmoral Cycling Club. Um, both of these clubs are well organised and an absolute dream to work with. The Balmoral Cycling Club were instrumental in helping Council to design the Brisbane International Cycle Park at the Murray Recreation Reserve. The new facility will be a huge benefit in helping our up and coming cyclists and BMX riders in the 2032 Olympics. The club and community are so excited for this facility to open and I can't wait to open it with the Lord Mayor and the committee next year. I also wanted to offer my support to the Tingalpa Model Aero Club for their lease. They are the only aero club in Brisbane and they have a very strong community spirit and they do so much more than flying planes. They absolutely love to go on camping trips, social trips at the club as well, and they host a large number of other aero clubs um, at their, to share their experiences and they have a great time. I love visiting them. But over the last four years, I've worked extensively with both clubs to put on events in the Doughboy Ward. 
We've always held them at the Murray Recreation Reserve, and we recently had to move them because of the upgrades to the Manipi Parklands, and we worked with the Tingalpa Model Aero Club this year, and they were a dream to work with. So I think we found ourselves a new home, um, but I'm really grateful that both of these clubs have an enormous community spirit. They're really, really well run and a dream to work with, and I recommend this to the Chamber also. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Atwood. Are there any further speakers? Be no one rising. Lord Mayor, write a reply. <laughs> there being no right of reply, uh, we'll now put item A of the report to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. We'll now put Division. Item... Division. I've already called the vote, Councillor Cassidy. I'd actually moved on to item B when you called division. Okay, okay. No, we're happy to take a division. Uh, we've got division called by Councillor Cassidy and I think it was seconded by Councillor Strunk. Thank you. All those, uh, sorry, eyes to my left, nose to my right, other way around. Clerks, please ring the bells, yes. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 18 in favour and five abstentions. <coughs> Item A has passed. <laughs> Councillors, we will now put item B. All those in favour, uh, item B, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we move on to, but before we do, can I just take a moment to acknowledge our former councillor in the gallery, Norm Wyndham. Norm, welcome back to, back to the chamber. Um, Deputy Mayor, Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympics. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Economic Development and the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the report of the Economic Development and Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October, 2023, be adopted. Point Deputy order, Mayor, you've Chair. got the call. Uh, sorry, Councillor Collier, for your point of order. I move that the motion currently lying on the table, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags on the Story Bridge come off the table for debate. Seconded. Thank you. We have a procedural motion to take a motion off the table and the motion reads that Brisbane City Council commits to urgently uh, installing the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags on the Story Bridge in addition to the Australian flag and that was moved by former Councillor Cook and seconded by Councillor Cassidy. All those in favour of taking the motion off the table say aye. Aye. Those against say no. Aye. Noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and seconded by Councillor Collier. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Clerks, please ring the bells. I got it right that time. Councillors, please, a bit of quiet and division. Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the um, noes have it, the voting being in five in favour and 17 against. 
councillors, the procedural motion has not passed. Please resume your seat. Councillors, you can resume your seats. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I've got uh, a double whammy this afternoon on the Business Hub because we love it so much. It was the report last week. But before that, I do want to actually talk about what's been happening and what's coming up in the Business Hub as I do each week. Um, this week on the 14th of November, uh, which is next Tuesday, we have How to Market Your Business Masterclass. So that is on from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. It is being um, run with our partner expert, Staunch Digital. And it's a comprehensive workshop designed to be the point without the fluff. So led by a marketing expert, it will provide you actionable strategies and invaluable insights to take your marketing to the next level. So fantastic opportunities if you've got businesses that are starting out in your community to get them along to that next Tuesday. We've also got some feedback over recent events. Um, how to write a great grant submission. It was the Women in Business edition. And some of the feedback was it was so impressed with the event, the space and everyone working there was so helpful. Uh, we also got fantastic, insightful help from our team for not only your upcoming $5,000 Women in Business grant, but also for other grants in the future. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, the speakers were really helpful. Nikki assisted me with specific questions after the event and followed up with a solution. So that's the type of feedback we love to hear. We are helping people. We're particularly helping women in business because we know that less than 40% of our local small to medium enterprises are run by women. And there's a great hot Wynnum, not run by Wynnum either, but run by women. We'll be running Wynnum soon. Uh, but. <laughs> But we are trying to encourage women now with the flexibility as of the hours and the opportunity and digital innovation to get into business if they ever thought they were interested and giving them that support as well. Last week's presentation was on the Business Hub because it was our third birthday. Can you believe that, Lord Mayor? Anniversary, third birthday of the Business Hub. And I just have to go through some of the actual statistics. In three years, 370 workshops and events, over 400 facilitators, 92% participant satisfaction, 445 mentoring sessions with over 90 mentors with 100% satisfaction from our participants. 12,950 unique businesses supported, 23,000 total visitors to the hub, including 12,100 using the co-working space and 10,900 event attendees. We've had over 86,300 website visits and 38,790 online subscribers. So whether you can come in person or you can come online, there is something for everybody and I encourage all councillors to please promote this fantastic resource to your businesses right throughout the city. We can definitely speak to them. The question and committee last week, what if your head's down and working too hard, you can't get into the city? We've also got our ED team with our business liaison officers out there to help people in the chambers and in their suburbs as well. I recommend the report to chambers. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. And uh, just on the um, presentation of the Brisbane Business Hub and to what uh, Councillor Adams just mentioned, then we did have a discussion around the support the Brisbane the Brisbane Business Hub can or can't and often doesn't um, provide to. Um, small suburban businesses, um, and I raise these issues, as Councillor Adams has uh, alluded to there, in that um, a lot of the bulk of Brisbane's small businesses that might otherwise like some support from Council, whether it's to keep the doors open, um, whether it's to expand their operations and diversify in a difficult um, economy, aren't getting the support they need from council to do that. And we had a discussion that there are some online options and things like that. Um, but I went and had a discussion about the Brisbane Business Hub with a local business, with the sort of, you know, trying to, to do the right thing and extol its virtues um, to this small business owner in my ward. Um, and just in that short conversation that I had with that business owner, um, so I, I learned some amazing things about the kind of support they would love to get from council but simply aren't. Um, they pay their footpath dining permit, um, they have a, the area marked out and 
pay for it. It's pretty extensive for a um, small cafe. Um, but the footpath's so damaged there that an elderly resident recently tripped over and broke bones, um, had to be taken away in an ambulance. Council came and looked at it and said that should be fixed soon. It's still not fixed. Um, still not fixed today. Um, they, they tried to diversify into selling some items that they produce in their, com their commercial kitchen, their approved kitchen by council um, at markets. Uh, and they were told they'd have to pay, it's close to $1,000 for a market, uh, a market permit, where across the bridge in the Moreton Bay Regional Council, it's half that. It's half the price. So that meant that business owner couldn't make that commitment to diversify their business. Um, and another one was their food licence. Uh, when they bought the business a couple of years ago, uh, and their first inspection occurred, of course, which it does, but doing the new food licence, and they were marked from Councillor a five Cassie, down just, to a three. Just give me one moment. Sorry. Councillor Hammond and Councillor Wolfe, if you would like to engage in conversation, can you please take yourself to the antechamber? Thank you. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, they were marked down to three stars because there was a non-compliant front counter and needed a, a sink in it. So this new owner of the business um, spent tens of thousands of dollars immediately rectifying it. Council came back and said, great, it's signed off, you are totally compliant, but you're stuck on a three-star rating for another two years. They couldn't put them back to a, uh, a five-star rating because they had to work their way each year through another star. Uh, and then they were told that they could go to the next star in the next 12 months, get another inspection. 18 months has passed and they haven't had that inspection to progress through that star rating. And why that's important, why that's point important of order. is... Just Mr. one moment, Chair. Councillor Cassidy. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. I'm happy to respond to this, but the report, again, Councillor Cassidy, very clear rules, is about the third year anniversary of the Business Hub. Thank you. This Dep is Council. Thank you, Deputy business Mayor. Hub. Thank you. You've, you've made your point. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, I'll draw you back to relevance item A, please. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Chair. So, the support that the business hub could provide this business, who it's a husband and wife operation, employing people locally as well, um, they're just not getting that support through the business hub. They're paying more, so when they're stuck on a three-star rating, their food licence fees are much higher, and, but they're left languished. For 18 months sat on that, that three-star rating, they're not progressing to the four and the five-star rating, even though they met all of the requirements of council. So when, when the deputy mayor gets up and, and you know, talks about the, the, um, the lobster lunches and the champagne and oysters and things like that, and the business hub um, supporting all of these entrepreneurs in Brisbane and venture capitalists and inventors and whatnot, they have totally forgotten the suburbs. Totally, totally forgotten the suburbs. This guy gets to the cafe at four in the morning. I met him there at three o'clock in the afternoon, still mopping the floors, and just wants some support from council to be able to progress through some very simple things, to be able to continue to put food on his own table and employ people in the local community. And what does he get from this LNP administration? Absolutely nothing. Further speakers? So no, no one rising. Deputy Mayor, write a reply. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Cassidy, through you, Mr Chair, has been in this place for eight years. And I'm so glad to see he finally got out of his office and spoke to a local business. <laughs> nice change. Apparently he spoke to a bus driver, but I, I call hogwash on that. I think he spoke to a union <laughs> member that represents the bus drivers. But this is the Food Safety Act that we need to deal with, which wait to see what's coming. But the Eat Safe is there for a reason. Now, this is not to do with the hub. Let's talk about the hub. Third year anniversary. I've got four sections across economic development that Councillor Cassidy still doesn't even recognise because he says, oh, maybe she does this and maybe she does that. But Eat Safe, a well-recognised, award-winning program that we developed in council, which is done through four or five other councils because it was such a good program, actually is about the safety of food. It's not about whether your food's good. Just it's one not moment. About Councillor Cassidy, there's no calling out across the chamber. Deputy Mayor. It's not whether your food is great or good or tasty or your, your service is superlative. It is about food safety. And we make no apologies for the hardest working cafe 
or the laziest cafe not getting a star that they don't deserve if they haven't complied with the food safety regulations. What I just heard there is that they work hard, so give them a food safety rating. That's what I heard. That is outrageous. But since Councillor Cassie has just woken up to this fact, that is about food safety. And as for no support through the suburbs, again, as I explained last week, it will be good, Councillor Cassidy. I'll take your shout across the chambers. How about you add Councillor Whatme about how... Whitme? Sorry. Oh, I don't know. Alice Gibney told me anyway. She was there last Thursday. The growing precincts together that we launched through ED last week in Wynnum. With the local businesses that came along and how much they enjoyed the support from Council... Just one moment, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Whitmer, you know that that's inappropriate and highly unprofessional. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Well, obviously, Councillor Whitmer is not speaking to the same people that Alex Gibney is. So lucky, after March next year, the business development officer and local business person, former local business person, will be down there in, Wy in Wynnum supporting the businesses, as we were in Sandgate through all of the work that we did in their precinct down there, as we were through Morningside when we did the precincts development and local business partnership initiatives down there, we are on the ground. If there is issues with the footpath, that is something that should be raised immediately. And I hope Council Cassidy didn't just chuck it on Facebook, but did actually report it to council officers or the chair. But it's not the business hub that manages the footpaths. And for him to say that we don't support business businesses because there's something wrong with the footpath is outrageous. As I said again, I'm glad that Councillor Cassidy finally got to see one of his local businesses. Just one moment, Deputy Mayor. Just one moment. Just one moment. Deputy Mayor. I've been to coffee with businesses in Sandgate, and you know what they tell me? Their councillor doesn't care about local business. He played political games with the neighbourhood plan, then changed his mind after the election. The state member ever said, oh, that was just politics, Krista. Now we'll have some density. Outrageous! Outrageous hypocrisy from these people who say they support local business but wouldn't know how to make their way out of a paper bag if they were asked. Three weeks, three taxes. What do you think that's doing to the people of Brisbane? I commend the report on the third anniversary of the Business Hub to the Chamber. We will now put item A to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Division seconded. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Hutton. Councillors, eyes to my right, nose to my left, and we will have the division in silence. Thank you. Please ring the bells. Those pretzels aren't making you thirsty, are they, Councillor Massey? Billy's keeping the water topped up. Mm. Clarks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The vote being, being 23 in favour. Councillors, the vote is unanimous. Please return to your seats. Council Murphy, Transport Committee, please. Chair, I move that the report of the Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023, be adopted. Seconded. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Murphy and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023, be adopted. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, last week in Transport Committee, we had a presentation on the Brisbane Metro Management System, or BMMS. Um, now, I haven't talked about this at, at great length at all uh, in the chamber ever because it's an IT system, an IT project, and um, you know those can be pretty pretty boring at the best of times, Chair. But um, look, we know we know that Metro will modernise uh, public transport in the city. We know it's going to really help us uh, to decarbonise public transport. Um, but the project isn't just about delivering vehicles or infrastructure upgrades. It's also about some serious smarts and intelligence going on uh, behind the scenes. So it might not sound flashy, but the BMMS is actually part of, uh, well, it's one of the parts of the Brisbane Metro project that actually uh, I'm personally looking uh, most forward to because it will transform the operational performance of the network and it will provide a, a world-class experience for the passenger. Uh, and that is, I think, a really, really important thing. So this system pulls together uh, data from the whole transport ecosystem, so uh, metro vehicles, uh, it, it gets data from TransLink, it receives information from the go-card system, the new go-card system, uh, information from the depot, from our bus scheduling system, Hastus, um, the, the network control centre, and uh, the SCADA system, which controls the battery uh, charging and the state of charge for all of our vehicles, which is, is working remotely uh, all the time on all our vehicles and in fact I'm advised is even enabled on the vehicles that are currently on their way to Australia um, uh, to, to arrive here to enter commissioning. So this BMMS is all about bringing together all of this information into a central system to give us a holistic view of our operations. So it will help us to better respond to incidents on the network and to feed that information directly into drivers, passengers and network controllers. Uh, it'll help us manage headway on our metro vehicles, not something we thought uh, would, would necessarily be possible at the start of the project. We've worked very um, carefully and collaboratively with Transync to be able to make sure we can manage headway um, on our metro vehicles, which is all about um, sp speeding them up or slowing them down within tolerances to make sure that they're arriving at a station uh, at the right time that they need to be. Um, the BMMS is also what facilitates uh, our onboard route displays and our next stop announcements as well. So at busway stations like King George Square and the Cultural Centre Station, we'll be implementing uh, intelligent transport systems to provide customers with information and accurate real-time ETAs, as well as better platform uh, legibility. And in fact, our metro vehicles will be running on an entirely different system than the rest of the TransLink. Uh, network, which provides a much better accuracy. So um, sometimes you'll see at a bus stop, bus arriving in two minutes and then it'll arrive in 30 seconds. Well, it won't be like that with the Metro. It will say, you know, 30 seconds for Metro, it'll be there within 30 seconds. So it'll be really highly accurate uh, data that will be coming uh, from this solution. We know that this will be a world-class solution because this solution is being implemented by world-class company, uh, Indra. Uh, who have worked, um, as I mentioned, uh, when this contract came through many months ago, now uh, by over 100 transport operators across 23 countries, cities that you would know, Chair, like uh, London, Sydney, Dublin, not sure if it's being used in Paris or Tokyo, um, but um, certainly some, some big uh, names there. Transport for London use uh, Indra almost exclusively. Um, most importantly, Chair, the BMS is being delivered on time and on schedule. Uh, so it is being delivered and executed as planned. Um, that is obviously in stark contrast to some of the other IT projects we've witnessed uh, in the transport space in this state chair. And a good example of that is smart ticketing, which was meant to roll out in 2019, then it was meant to roll out in 2020, then it was meant to roll out in 2021, then it was meant to roll out in 2022, now we're in 2023, we're almost at the end of 2023, and uh, I'm pretty confident, <laughs> Chair, that uh, we'll still be seeing smart ticketing rolling out in, in 2024 uh, as well. The longest rollout... Uh, <laughs> uh, well, funnily enough, and I'll, I'll take that uh, interjection from the Lord Mayor, Chair, he asked uh, who got smart ticketing last? Uh, and of course the answer is Brisbane City Council uh, got smart ticketing last. Uh, and I'll take that interjection from the Lord Mayor, uh, Chair. Lord Mayor asked who made that decision. Of course, the answer to that question is Minister Mark Bailey, who, uh, you know, we, we do know, we do know Minister Mark Councils, Bailey, um, because of his uh, 
Uh, and I don't blame I genuinely I don't blame TransLink for this, Chair. TransLink are trying to do the best job with a minister who uh, makes partisan attacks against this council, who who defunds uh, this you know the bus services in this city as a result of this council being on the opposite side of politics to him. Um, that is not good enough. Uh, and, and it's the residents of the city of Brisbane lose out as a result. 1.2 million residents who would like to have investment. And, and, and frankly, Chair, I'll take that interjection from the Lord Mayor. It's right. The um, Minister Bailey has a weird obsession with this council. It's like he's not gotten over whatever happened in 2003 when he was here, Labor backbencher, wasn't successful, left politics, came back as a minister. Just, and now and just now one we moment, find please. Just one moment. Lord Mayor, if you're going to direct any comments to other councillors in the chamber, can you please do it through the chair? Thank you. Councillor Murphy. So the point that I'm making here, Chair, is that uh, Brisbane City Council is the last transport organisation in the state to be getting smart ticketing. Uh, and I believe we'll still be rolling out that smart ticketing in 2024 at the pace that we're going at. Uh, I think that's really sad, a real disappointment. Um, but again, I'm not surprised because the same thing we've seen time and time again uh, from Minister Bailey is that he treats this council differently than anyone, any other organisation that he works with to deliver transport, whether that's private operators, whether that's other uh, councils in the, in the business of operating transport around the state. Um, we are the ones who get treated differently. Uh, and, and I think it's not, it's not us who lose politically. We don't lose. We're not affected by that. Um, what is affected is the residents of the city of Brisbane, the commuters who lose out. The commuters that have been waiting for 10 years for investment in new growth services in their area, but poor TransLink, their officers have to come to us and they just look at us and the face just drops and they go, oh, sorry, we, we've only got um, inflation funding in the budget this year again, so, uh, yeah. And, and, and you can see they're just, they're as disappointed as our officers that the fact that they keep being held back politically, uh, interfered with in order to be able to deliver these services to Brisbane residents. So, um, um, and you know, while we're on IT projects, Chair, I can't help but have a laugh at the, um, yeah, much like the smart ticketing, the uh, digital driver's licence system, which also uh, Minister Bailey, the um, Minister for Digital Services, I think now, uh, ro rolled out over the, um, the last week uh, in trial for, I think, over 800 days in this state. And of course, um, when people tried to sign up, it was a complete debacle and disaster. So, um, but that is, um, that is what we've come to expect. So uh, I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Is there any further debate on item A? See no one rising. We will now put the report. All of those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October, 2023, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Hammond and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October, 2023, be adopted. Councillor Hammond, is there any debate? Being Point no of debate. Chair. Yes, Councillor Yes, Strong. could we ask for item B to be uh, taken seriatim for voting purposes, please? Noted. For, uh, so item B for voting only? Yep, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Uh, is there any further debate? There being no debate, I will now put item B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Strunk and seconded by Councillor Collier. Eyes to my right and nose to my left. Clerks, please ring the bells.
Clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 18 in favour and five against. Thank you. The item B has passed. Councillors, please return to your seats. Councillors will now put items A, C and D to the vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Hutton. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. We have a, a motion for afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by the Deputy Mayor for a period of 15 minutes. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. See you in uh, 15 minutes, councillors. Councillors, uh, we are up to city planning and suburban renewal. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Atwood that the report of City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 23rd, sorry, Tuesday the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, before moving to the committee report, I would just like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of Councillor Fiona Hammond as the, uh, the Deputy Chair of the City Planning and Suburban Renewal Committee for uh, quite some time up until recently, so uh, certainly her contribution to that committee has been terrific and certainly a good sounding board um, from time to time, so uh, thank you very much for your contribution, Councillor Hammond. Um, turning to the committee report, uh, item A was a committee presentation on our Housing Supply Action Plan. Mr Chair, it should be no surprise to uh, my colleagues in the Chamber that uh, housing is a challenge in our growing city. We know Brisbane is projected to grow from a population of approximately 1.26 million people in 2021 to a city of 1.72 million people in 2046. To accommodate this growth, the city will need 209,700 new homes by 2046. This equates to approximately 8,500 new homes every year. Through the development of our housing strategy released earlier this year, research has also shown that 56% of all Brisbane households are singles and couples with no children. However, when this figure is compared to the available supply, unfortunately, less than one third of all Brisbane homes are one and two bedrooms. And whilst Council has nearly a decade of housing supply approved, we need to look at ways to make it easier to construct these approved dwellings to deliver quality, affordable and well-located housing. As such, the Housing Supply Action Plan includes the Housing Supply Incentive. The incentive looks to reduce infrastructure charges for the delivery of studio, one and two bedroom apartments across both build to rent and build to sell developments. And it is concentrated in smaller targeted areas to address and provide additional supply for these smaller households. These targeted areas include those that are already planned for higher density living, such as high density residential, principal and major centres and mixed use inner city zones. Developers with a current eligible development approval from 1st of January 2022 can apply for a 75% infrastructure charges reduction. Additionally, developers will have until the 30th of June 2025 to apply for new development approvals and up until the 1st of April 2026 to apply for up to 50% of the infrastructure charge reductions. For a development to be eligible, construction must be completed within four years from when the application is approved. But the biggest winner is our community housing providers who will receive a 100% permanent and ongoing reduction to make it even easier for them to deliver vital social housing. The Brisbane Housing Company have recently stated that under this incentive they will be able to save up to a million dollars for every 100 homes they deliver. Mr Chair, we received several questions during the presentation that were taken on notice and I'd like to provide an update on these. Councillor Johnston asked how many have benefited from the incentive 
as the policy sets out criteria for this incentive, including approved developments that had not yet commenced construction and required developments to be completed within four years, there are yet to be any development sites that have received the reduction. However, interest in the incentive has been overwhelming. Councillor Johnson also asked how many approved DAs that are not yet constructed and the breakdown on these DAs in respect to detached, semi and attached dwellings. As the incentive is aimed at higher density living, such as high density residential, principal and major centres and mixed use inner city zones, eligible applications would be attached multi-unit dwellings. As such, I can confirm that over 40 sites who have received a development approval since the 1st of January 2022 have been identified within these zones. Across these sites, there is the potential to provide over 3,100 additional dwellings for the city, increasing much needed supply. With 96% of all homes built by the private sector, clearly government alone can't solve this housing challenge. Our plan is the biggest step taken so far to kickstart the construction of new homes, but it is the right thing to do with the limited levers Council has to help solve the housing crisis. Reducing infrastructure charges will help reduce construction costs and achieve more housing in key growth areas with good access to high frequency public transport, jobs and facilities. And I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Massey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I rise to speak on the Housing Supply Action Plan briefing. Um, I sat on the committee last week. It was the first time that I sat, so I thank Councillor Allen through you, Chair. Um, and, and I do have to state um, on the record that that committee was unexpectedly volatile and definitely not a safe working environment. <laughs> um, but I did want to highlight some other points um, around the Supply Action Plan briefing. You know, since when the T uh, TLPI, since the TLPI Karupa was presented firstly here in Chambers, I've been stating clearly the whole time that this blunt instrument would be used across the city. And in this presentation, we have the clearest demonstration that it will be. Um, and this blunt instrument that will be used across the city is something that would suspend the city plan in so many areas and will undoubtedly supersede the height limits of all the neighbourhood plans in those areas. Um, and of course, doing that um, creates major concerns for the local communities. Um, and this kind of distribution across the city will undeniably happen without community consultation. And it will happen in areas like Milton, Albion, Tawong, Fortitude Valley, Chermside, Wynnum, Carindale, Indrapilly, Mount Gravatt, and Newstead. Um, but the thing is, these communities are organising. Um, the political apathy that the LMP are hoping for, especially in the place of development, public housing and affordable housing, is disappearing. And people are engaged, aware, um, and you know what, specifically in New Farm and Tenerife, they're really activating out there. It's, it's going to be a bit of a fight. They're really getting together out there. And further to the TLPI, which is in the um, Housing Supply Action Briefing, it's looking a bit like a furphy, isn't it? Because it turns out that even developers don't want to build to unlimited heights. So we're, we're actually yet to see if that TLPI is going to have the effect that it should. Um, and the other thing is we are yet to see if these tax breaks for developers will achieve anything. But what we do know is one of Brisbane City Council's primary function, which is infrastructure delivery, will be affected. Not just by the $400 million black hole, but also the developer cuts. So these communities, our communities across this chamber, Milton, Albion, Tawong, Fortitude Valley, Chermside, Wynnum, Carindale, and Drapinley, Mount Gravatt, and Newstead will see less or nothing in the way of infrastructure deliveries like drainage parks, park upgrades, footpaths, and active transport. Um, some of the core work that this council is supposed to do 
I mean, speaking of infrastructure, this is what I mean that people are getting aware. This weekend alone, I had eight conversations, very randomly, about this shade sales on Victoria Bridge and how upset people were. And you know what? They weren't from the south side. This weekend alone, I had, I think, about 10 conversations about how dangerous Wickham Street and Ann Street are. You know, people are cluing in, they are getting aware, and we need to do better. As rents keep rising, we continue again to fail in our work to create mandatory housing affordability, to ease the burden. Ease the burden of a rent rate increase of 45% since 2021. Ease the burden of a 12.7% rental e increase for renters just this past year. And in this, we're not only failing currently, we're actually failing in the future because there is, again, no mandatory housing affordability in the TLPR, something that it definitely looks like is going to be distributed across the city. And, and through you, Chair, Councillor Allen talked about community providers being the big winner. Well, that's not true. We know who the big winners are going to be. It's developers. It's going to be developers. And yet we are yet to see if the TLPI and these tax breaks will work. But as I've said publicly and as often as possible, everyone is getting clued in and you better bet I'll be there and so will be the Greens for these communities that are activating across the city because we are for these communities and not for tax breaks for developers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Massey. Are there any further speakers to the city planning report? I see no one rising. Councillor Allen? Well, thank you, Mr Chair. What a astounding contribution from Councillor Massey. Now, there are a couple of people on this side of the chamber who were sitting in that committee meeting last week, and some of the points Councillor Massey made weren't mentioned in that committee meeting. So, you know, it's as if she was in a different meeting or perhaps in a parallel universe, but there was no mention made of TLPIs being used across the city. Not one mention. So I don't know where she dreamt that up from, you know. Yeah, I, I, I'm certainly not, uh, you know, working on a TLPI for somewhere else across the city. You know, it's not our preferred uh, mechanism to, to, to bring about planning changes, but it is the only one that we've got available to us at the moment by, under the State Planning Act. However, however, we are working with the state on other planning processes which will hopefully put us in a position where TLPIs aren't re required. So it was an extraordinary contribution because there was no mention of using TLPIs elsewhere in the city. The, um, the, the, the notion that you know, TLPIs give you, you know, are going to result in you know, 80 storey or 90 storey buildings, that's false as well. I mean, the reality is it gives uh, developers an opportunity to go higher in these locations in Karelpa but whether they actually do that is up to them. And at this point in time, the suggestion would be that they won't be reaching those sorts of heights. But we are looking for additional density in Karelpa because it's the right place to put it. It's well serviced by public transport and other amenity. And we've said this numerous times in the chamber. It is the right location. We've put in place the framework. The state government have now got the current TLPI and that will be the basis upon which development proceeds in that particular precinct. And I think Councillor Massey's contribution is yet another example of the Greens not supporting housing. Make no mistake, the Greens are not supporters of housing. They have consistently opposed point of neighbourhood order. plans. Just one moment, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Massey. Uh, point misrepresentation. Of order. Noted. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Well, Councillor Massey did open up the conversation on housing, um, but nonetheless, the, this sort of notion that um, our initiative to try and bring forward the supply of studio one and two bedroom ha housing is not a good thing is demonstrably incorrect. We have a supply challenge in this city Developers are facing significant cost challenges. 
If anybody would just go out and investigate what's happening in the industry, they would be told the reality of the situation. We have to bring down costs to build in order to uh, get that supply on the ground. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, we're doing that in a way that's very targeted, that's going to produce the right products in the right location. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Massey, your point of misrepresentation, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've stated many times that I support low, medium and high density development and high density development within our city plan that is 30 storeys high. Thank you, Councillor Massey. We will now put the report to the chamber. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillor Davis, Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting of Tuesday 31 October be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Davis and seconded by Councillor Wolf that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, uh, Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Councillor Davis. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Before I go to the report, can I also acknowledge Councillor Fiona Hammond? Uh, as you would know, Councillor Hammond was chair of the EPS committee for some time, and in that time that she did, um, she did have stewardship of the portfolio area. She really um, delivered a whole range of projects which we can be very proud of, or certainly started some of the projects for which uh, have now been delivered, including the extraordinary Bradbury Park. So can I thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Hammond, for your um, efforts in this role. Um, they will be remembered for a very long time and, uh, of course, I wish you well in your future endeavours. Uh, Mr Chair, last week's committee presentation was on the Brisbane Botanic Gardens Visitor Experience Program and it was great to have uh, Dale Arvidson uh, present to us. Uh, Dale, as you would know, heads up the curatorial team at uh, the Mount Coother Botanic Gardens. Uh, and he presented on how this, uh, our network of very passionate uh, volunteers work to activate um, one of Brisbane's most iconic parklands, which of course is the Mount Coother Botanic Gardens. Um, the Brisbane Botanic Gardens at Mount Coother are often the first tourist site uh, experienced by international and interstate visitors, with uh, approximately 30% of all garden visitors coming from outside of Brisbane. The gardens also attract a large number of school groups with over 5,000 visitors last year and over 3,800 so far this year, well on track for 6,000 this year. The volunteer welcomers and guides uh, work to enrich the visitor experience with their knowledge about the garden's features, uh, with not only the ability to guide people around the gardens, but also pass on deeper knowledge of some of the park's features. Our volunteers also assist with a range of events aimed to educate our visitors about the wonder of plants, both large and small, within the Botanic Gardens. The events held at the gardens are designed to cater for a wide range of functions, from small bespoke site-specific ones to larger commercial functions that have up to 2,000 people attending. All of the events are focused on promoting plants within the garden and celebrating the beauty and diversity of plants in our subtropical environment. While a lot of our volunteers had been with the gardens for more than a decade, more volunteers are always welcome. We have actually just commenced training our 2023 <laughs> annual intake of new volunteers, which I'm told is a very informative course that takes about a month. Mr Chair, we also had a petition requesting Council amend our policy to Flying Fox Management and develop a plan to move Flying Foxes on, and this was unanimously supported by the committee. And for the record, the committee endorsed an expenditure from the Suburban Enhancement Fund approving the upgrade of the picnic area node at Martindale Street Park in Chermside West. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Are there any further speakers? I see no one rising. We will now put the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report to the vote. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Um, under section 42.2J, um, I would like to move a motion of apology for Councillor Wines. It's come to my attention that he won't be joining us this afternoon. And I move that the Chambers accept an apology and grant him leave for this meeting. Seconded. We have an apology motion uh, for Councillor Wines. Uh, all, it's a procedural motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. 
Uh, where am I up to? City Standards. Councillor Adaman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I move the report of the City Standards Committee meeting held on Tuesday, 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Adaman and seconded by Councillor Hutton that the report of the City Standards Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Councillor Adaman, you've got the call. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Last week, the City Standards Committee received an update on the Sherwood Arboretum. The Arboretum is overseen by Council's Public Space Operations team, which ensures its upkeep through horticultural and habitat maintenance, as well as the construction of new pathways and infrastructure upgrades. The Sherwood Arboretum displays strong values in flora and education with its living collection, habitat management for wildlife and for the community as a valuable recreational green space as we lead up to the 100th anniversary in 2025. I'd like, also like to acknowledge, as uh, Councillor Davis did, um, Dale Arvison and his team for the tremendous work they do at the Arboretum. I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adam. It sounds like uh, Dale Arvison had a busy day last Tuesday. Uh, any further speakers? There being none, we'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Community Arts and Nighttime Economy, Councillor Howard. Well, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Landers that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 31st of October 2023, be adopted. Councillor Howard, you've got the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And before moving to the, re the report, um, I'd just like to mention a few things that have happened around Brisbane this week. And I already um, spoke about Valley Fiesta at length, so I will leave that one. But just to say that longest running street party in the world. Um, and of course, we also had Homeless Connect that, uh, that occurred last Friday. And yet again, we had um, over 700 guests. We had over 200, almost 300 volunteers, 1,920 meals, and um, we had 3,474 visits to 58 service providers, 133 haircuts, and 590 bags of food distributed with 22 pallets of food and toiletries, 13 pallets of clothes and three pallets of shoes. And I can tell you that the ladies who do the knitting of the blankets are indeed the most popular spot and that they were the first call for uh, many, uh, many a people that, that arrived last week. It was fantastic to see so many um, familiar faces there and, and I very much enjoyed visiting the different stalls, the different services that were on offer, um, but also to know that we have many of our council officers who gave up their time and volunteered. And I really want to um, mention Peter, who has been a volunteer for 28 years. And uh, I think that deserves a special mention and uh, really want to say a huge thank you to all of those who organise such a large event. It is in, it's, in, it's run incredibly well and I know that a lot of work goes into it. Chris Murder, I think, um, is someone that we also need to mention because it really was um, a fantastic event, as it always is. Um, I'd also like to mention Diwali, the Indian Festival of Lights. I know that there were lots of Diwalis right across Brisbane and that many of our councillors in the chamber attended. Um, and I know there was a very big one outside in um, King George Square, but um, it's fantastic, again, that we have such a wonderful multicultural community that we can, um, that we can sort of attend those wonderful events. Um, I'd also like to mention St James College, who ran their very first creative arts showcase in their new building um, in Fortitude Valley. And I just want to say a big shout out to St James College. They have a lot of uh, um, students that come from right across Brisbane. They're very, there's not very many that come from the local area. There, there's a lot of children who um, attend who are from refugee backgrounds, and they do the most amazing job of supporting these young people. Um, and uh, I just want to say a big thank you to St James College. Uh, I also attended Fantastics, which was uh, the inimitable uh, Gail Wilshire and Twelfth Night Theatre. And 
Um, Gail just loves what she does. Uh, we, had the, we had a wonderful opportunity to showcase um, the, the fantastic artists that uh, she had been mentoring. And, and again, a fantastic afternoon and something that just uh, is what makes Brisbane, Brisbane. Um, I also attended the Area 25 Toastmasters Conference and was pleased to see that uh, we had some of our very own Brisbane City Council Toastmasters there. Um, and again, uh, what a great opportunity for people to learn new skills and to, uh, to really sort of showcase again um, the, the, the Toastmasters and, and what they do for a very long time across Brisbane and it was a it was a great opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about what they do and the, the areas that they represent. Um, on Sunday, um, I was pleased to attend the 4MBS Brisbane Shakespeare Festival, The Tempest, along with uh, their patron, the Governor. We sat out um, in Roma Street Parklands and had the most amazing opportunity to see local Shakespearean artists perform, much as they probably would have performed uh, way back when in the open air. And uh, it was, uh, of course, uh, uh, a fantastic event and uh, the rain did not um, fall on our parade and so again it was uh, it was brilliant and also I want to um, acknowledge Councillor Wines in his absence who uh, yet again took out the councillor's croquet cup uh, each year um, we mirth are croquet people and the Windsor croquet people get together um, I think I've won it twice I think we've won it twice over the last seven years but uh, Councillor Wines and the Windsor croquet people have, uh, have really sort of done themselves proud and have taken out the, <laughs> the other events. So it was a great event. Um, I really want to, again, thank these wonderful clubs right across Brisbane. We have um, croquet clubs, we have bowls clubs, we have so many people that contribute to making Brisbane such a beautiful city that it is. And moving to the report, we can talk about some more things that make Brisbane as beautiful as it is, where we had a presentation last week on the Queensland Music Trails Sweet Relief. And yet again, we heard um, from the team that uh, put all of this together about the amazing work that they had done at North Shore Hamilton. This year, um, the festival was, was held in, the, in this area and it really was an opportunity for them to set it up in such a way that they also partnered with Spinal Life Australia and the festival was accessible and inclusive and they were at great pains to explain to us how that had occurred and it was uh, something that I think that we're all very proud of. So the festival was delivered in conjunction with a range of industry and government partnerships and it was an exceptional visitor experience that um, that they hope to um, grow further into the new year. So on that note, uh, Mr Chair, I will leave further debate to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Are there any further speakers? We see no one rising. We will now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cunningham, Finance and City Governance Committee meeting, please. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Cunningham and seconded by Councillor Huang that the report of the Finance and City Governance Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 31st of October 2023 be adopted. Councillor Cunningham, you've got the call. Thanks, Mr Chair. Uh, just briefly, our presentation last week was about the Brisbane Emergency Services Expo, which was held at Victoria Park, Barambin on the 14th of October, at the end of the state government's Get Ready Queensland Week. The event was a joint initiative of Brisbane City Council and Get Ready Queensland. There were 40 exhibitors in total, twice as many as the previous year. It included 12 teams from across council, including City Resilience, of course, Wars, Cars and News, we love our acronyms, and a number of external exhibitors as well. There was a great uh, turnout from our LDMG partners, who had stand sharing messaging and providing valuable resilience information on ways to prepare, prevent, respond and recover from severe weather hazards that we face in our city, with bushfires obviously being a threat this season. It was a family focused event, as we know that young people can be a great driver of behaviour change at home, pester power as they call it, a few of us would be very familiar with it. 
We had a number of emergency services vehicles on display, as well as our bin trucks or waste trucks, which I'm told was actually the most popular display at the event on the day. Uh, of course, the event was also an opportunity for residents to thank our city's everyday heroes, including our Brisbane City SES unit. It was estimated that once again over 10,000 people attended the expo and I thank everyone involved in their hard work and on a personal note, I'm very sorry to have missed it as I was unwell, quite unwell on the day. Thanks Mr Chair. Thank you Councillor Cunningham. Are there any further speakers? I see no one rising. We will now put the Finance and City Governance Committee report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we move on to a presentation of petitions. Are there any petitions? Councillor yes. Hutton. Mr Chair, I have got a petition um, with regards to a skate park at Newcombe Park. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. The petition requesting Council ease restrictions on alcohol consumption in Council green spaces and parks. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Are there any further petitions? No. Councillor Hutton, can I have a motion of acceptance, please? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the Committee Concern for consideration and report. Second. It has been moved by Councillor Hutton and seconded by Councillor Strunk that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the Committee's Concern for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of the Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? I see no one rising. Councillors, are there any matters of general business? Thank you, Mr Chair. Just bear one moment, me. Councillor Hammond. Now you've got the call. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, please bear with me because it might be a teary affair. Whew. Today I rise to make my final speech in this place. I told you I couldn't do it, team. I stand before you with mixed emotions, excited about my new chapter, but sad to say goodbye to this one. I first walked in here 15 and a half years ago as a young, naive mother of two young children, full of ideas of how to make Marchant better. I quickly learned that it was not my ideas that mattered. It was the ideas of residents and bringing their ideas to life. I also learnt that everything we do is going to have support and opposition. Every resident's view is important and as a politician you are not instantly believed. And this is why I do a lot of public meetings, street meetings, mobile offices, so residents can hear that other residents may have different views and their views are just as important. I love this when a resident said to me, do you stay awake late at night thinking of ways to just annoy us? Well the simple answer is no and we've all been there in this place. To the new councillors, the important thing for us to remember is to listen and that we make friends and lose friends every day and we are not going to make everyone happy. Whether it's a footpath, bikeway or road upgrade, what I say to you is don't be afraid to stand up to your residents and explain, front your residents and explain and sometimes support changes to a project. Don't behind behind your desk. Get out there and listen because that's what we're paid to do, to be the people's representative. This administration that I have had the honour to be a part of has a proven track record of delivery and there are so many, too many to mention in only 10 minutes. Number one, working with the local people at the Stafford Skate Bowl. I empowered them by giving them ownership of the park and it was amazing to see that the crime rate dropped by 80%. Been open, honest with them and spending nearly every second day back in 2009 down there getting them to organise events and even doing a photo shoot in the bowl. One of my fondest memories is when I was in the bowl, the kids weren't going to let me out um, until I promised for some improvements at the, at the local park. Thankfully, the boys and young ladies let me out and we have exercise equipment and dog off leash area down there now, which is both used very well. G-Bunk overpasses number two. The major infrastructure upgrade had been promised for nearly 100 years, a lot like the railway to Redcliffe. Well, it took an LNP council and an LNP state government to deliver and what a difference it has made to the local community. Other major intersection upgrades like Maundell Terrace, Hamilton Road, uh, Murphy Road intersection upgrade, um, Ellison and Kirby, Days Road and Raymont Road. Um, all of these came by listening to residents, careful planning and construction. I'm so proud of the council that their continued work done at the Kedgen Brook restoration after the terrible floods in 2022. I would like to thank the residents for their patience while we built back better. 
Other milestones I am proud of delivering are the Chermside and Grange Library upgrades, getting Valley's Football Club the extra fields once um, the Grange archers moved on. Sorry, Geraldine Knapp, I know you wanted tennis courts there, and it took you approximately 18 months to forgive me, but I can say that Valleys are very happy and so is the community. One of the sad saddest but proudest events which occurred was the Brothers Football Club house burning down in early 2012. The controller of the Chermside station at the time was Chris, and he was also the coach of the club. Scotty, another fiery, was also president of the club at the time, and he was on his way in the fire truck when he woke his wife up at 1.30am to bring the keys down to the clubhouse just in case they needed access. This is what I love about our community. We are so connected. I said at the time I had the trifecta, not that I support gambling. I was mum, patron and counsellor of the local club, and I was happy to see the administration at the time jump into action and give in 2012 dollars half a million dollars for the new clubhouse. Not only this, but the Northside footy community, as far as Debra, did their own fundraising to support brothers. This is real community of which I am so proud. This proves that community is not defined by electoral boundaries. Mayfair at Lennon Park is another project I'm so proud of. Um, I started this in 2008, but it could not have been possible without Inner North Rotary, formerly Sca um, Stafford Rotary. Without you Rotarians, Mayfair would never have happened. I have been honoured to be patron of many clubs and organisations over the years, including Brothers Juniors Rugby League, Valleys Football Club, Metropolitan Dog Obedience and the local um, Chermside um, Ambulance Committee. Um, Although I'm standing down, I'll always be there to support you. I would like to say big thanks to Valleys and Brothers for making me their, again, 2024 club patron. Thank you. To Valleys and Brothers, I always enjoyed wearing mixed uniforms when you played against each other, and my greatest embarrassment was doing the first kick at one of your senior games. I've never been asked back. But I can promise you I, will, I have practised my kicks since then, and I'm so happy I gave it a go. Again, as a result of listening to my community, I have delivered many park up, local park upgrades over the years. And of course, this year I was so proud to stand beside Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner and Chair Tracy Davis at the opening of the fantastic new play space at Bradbury Park, which transformed a dusty, dry space which no one used into one of the most visited parks in our city. Um, a park which delegations from council as far as way, as way as Western Australia have come to see how Brisbane just does things better. I have been honoured through my career to have the opportunity to name two parks in my wards. Both parks were new. The first was Terry Hampson Reserve. This administration has always been dedicated to a clean, green Brisbane. I was proud to announce that council had purchased 1.9 hectares of green space and it would be named after the great Terry Hampson a previous Labor member for Marchant. If Terry was still with us, I would say thank you. He never played party politics with me. We both had mutual respect for each other because we both put our community first, always. I would like to turn to one of my many sporting groups, and that is Warehouse Cricket. Warehouse Cricket has been played at Marchant Park for over 100 years. Its centenary couldn't be celebrated because of COVID, and I want to say, to the stalwart Lawrence Christie, you are amazing. Your passion for cricket is understated. And I'd like to thank you personally for your for supporting my brother who has an intellectual dis my brother-in-law, sorry, who has an intellectual disability and who has, like you, an amazing passion for cricket. Also, thank you for introducing me to my all-time cricket hero, Kepler Vessels. <laughs> I recently hosted a charity cricket match in Stafford, which I hope will be an annual event to support Hearts of Purple, a great organisation delivering real action for at-risk women and men in DV. The match was supported by our, our Indian community and congratulations to the Napoleons who won the day. I'm so proud to say Councillor Davis and my 89-year-old mum were our opening batters. A big thank you to Councillor Davis and Councillor Adaman for supporting this great cause. However, I do have a complaint to make about Councillor Adaman's umpiring. There was no wides made on my watch. To my wonderful ward staff over the many years, Liz, Yvonne, Karen, and my current ward office staff, Elizabeth, Caroline, and especially to you, Anthony, you have been my PA for eight of the 15 years in office. Thank you for the work you have done for me, but more importantly, the thank, thank you for what you have done for the people of Marchant, dealing with day-to-day -day issues and delivering outcomes. 
to my mother. <laughs> you have always been and always will be an ALP supporter, but I thank you for wearing the LNP shirt and handing out how to votes for me, and I'll always remember you to explaining to the ALP you didn't know where you went wrong, but you always supported me. I always... I also thank Mum for taking a risk on the LNP next election and voting for Alex Gibney. <laughs> to Hopewell, I wanted to say a few Shauna words. However, I will mess it up in this state. I'll say it badly. Vamba Zenanaka. Looking at my husband to see if I said it right and I didn't. Um, to the Chamber team, thank you, Billy, for filling up my Mentos and water and the clerks. Thank you for putting up with the Chamber nonsense at times. Lastly, but certainly not least, we, we could not do this job without the support of our families. A massive thank you to my husband, Neil, for believing in me and supporting me on this new adventure. Without you, I could never have made this braced, brave step. In kid order, Sean, I want to be a grandma, so hurry up. And I am so proud that you're embracing farming like your dad. Kylie, wow, what do I say about you? You're an amazing horsewoman, and your father and I are so proud of the woman you've grown into. Please marry Lily and give me a grandchild. <laughs> Alex, I could not be prouder of you. You have chosen a career as a soldier, and this makes me so proud that you have chosen to serve your country in this way. Oh, and so I come to Piper. Where do I start with you? When I told you I was stand, to stand down, you have been so very supportive. You have been a part of my campaign team since you were three years of age, and you have always embraced the challenges would have come your way. I am so proud of the young woman that you have turned into, and no Carsten and Piper, no grandchildren yet. <laughs> to your, our youngest, Jodie, please be the best artist we know you can be. To my biggest supporter, my dad, Neil. Oh my goodness, where do I start with you, Dad? Thank you, Dad, for believing me always. You told me, all of us kids, that we can achieve whatever we put our mind to, and you led by example. I would not be standing here today delivering this speech without you, Dad. Thank you. To the team of 2000, class of 2008, it's been a wild ride and I've loved working with you all the way through for the last 15 and a half years. To the whole team, Team Shrina, I know that you are going to bring, give it all to the residents of Brisbane and be successful in victory in March next year, 2024. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hammond, and uh, thank you for your service to Brisbane. Are there any other items of general business? Councillor Whitney. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just talking on one item of general business today, but it's an important one. Homophobia has no place in Brisbane. Just last week, in these chambers, we were all excited to have Tom Oliver come in and talk to us about what 2023 Wynnum Fringe is going to be like. One of those acts is the Wynnum Pride Parade. Unfortunately, in the past week, some LNP members have shown that they do not support the LGBTQI plus community in the Bayside area or Tom Oliver's Pride Festival. They have even gone so far as to call local businesses and demand that they pull funding from Wynnum Fringe. Joan Pease, the member for Lytton, invited LNP candidates and MPs to join us in supporting the Pride Festival and taking a stand against discrimination. We're still waiting for LNP members to stand up, put party politics Point aside and grow a spine. Just one moment, Councillor Whitney. Point of order, Councillor Hammond. Um, I find that offensive. I just wished my daughter to marry her female partner and to be told that I want my daughter to be married and I want her to give me a child. I find that disgraceful and untrue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Whitmy, can I caution you on your question? I would... Mm -hmm. I yeah, would, very clear hang about on, being I haven't finished yet. I would ask you to withdraw the statement, noting that there are members in this chamber who have close friends and family in, no, do not. Do not. In relationships. Um, if I had have been able to finish my sentence. 
You've offended another councillor, Councillor Whitmy. I'm advising you to withdraw. Okay, I'll withdraw the statement and then finish my sentence. Start again and finish my sentence. Thank you. We are still waiting. Uh, point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Murphy. Uh, I haven't seen anything Councillor Whitmy's talking about. I'm just wondering if she has a document to table or anything she could table. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, sorry, Councillor Murphy. Uh, just, Councillor Massey. No. Councillor Murphy, can you clarify what you're asking, please? I, I was just asking, quite genuinely, if Councillor Whitmy has um, anything to table, that that would be helpful. Yeah. In, in terms of what? Oh, it's a question. Sorry, sorry. Now I understand. Um, Council Whitmy, uh, Council Murphy would like to know if you have any documents to table no. to support your allegations. No, okay, thank you. You've got the call. We're still waiting for any local LNP member to step up, put party politics aside and grow a spine. A letter is currently being circulated to express our support for Wynnum Fringe and Bay Pride, addressed to our local sponsors. Out of the three announced candidates, I am the only one with the courage to sign it, to condemn bigotry and fully support Wynnum Fringe and Tom Oliver. I do this as a member of the LGBTQI community. I do this as a proud member of Rainbow Labor. As a leader in our community and a human capable of empathy. Remember these words. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. Deputy Mayor, Council with me. Everyone who fails to condemn homophobia should hang their head in shame for not having the courage to stand up for what's right, what's fair and what's equal. Sorry, Deputy Mayor. Oh. Councillor Howard jumped before you. I'd like to speak on the Wynnum Fringe Festival. Can I give you the call, Councillor Howard? You've got the call. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr Chair, what we have just heard in this chamber is appalling. Absolutely appalling. The LNP just like the ALP, the Greens, any other political party, is made up of a very, very broad churches with people who say things that do not represent the party's views. Something that's placed on Facebook does not necessarily represent the truth. What we've just heard in this chamber is a fellow councillor labelling other councillors as homophobic. I find that incredibly offensive. Just one moment, please, Councillor Howard. Councillor Whitmy. I did not call just anyone. One, just one moment. Misrepresentation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Howard. Through you, Mr Chair. I heard the words that the LNP were homophobic. That is what I heard. Now, point of order. Point of order, Councillor. I asked Councillor Howard to withdraw what she just said. That's not what I said, and the transcript will reflect. Um, I said there are members of the LNP that are homophobic, and I do take personal offence by what she just said. Councillor Whitmy, you're rising on a point of order. Councillor, you've asked for a right of reply. Right. Can we hear? You've still got that. Are you willing to? You'd like two rights of reply? Thank you, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, sorry, Chair. sorry, my, my mistake. Sorry, Councillor Cassidy, my mistake. It was two right, uh, two misrepresentations. My apologies, yeah. Councillor Cassidy. Just seeking some clarification, Councillor Whitmy just asked Councillor Howard to withdraw something. You directed Councillor Whitmy to withdraw, and she did earlier. Yes, she did. You don't listen ever. Uh, I, I advised council. I didn't direct Councillor Whitmy. I advised her to withdraw it. Are you advising Councillor Howard to withdraw that statement? Because Councillor Whitmy just made very clear that she was offended by that, and what Councillor Howard was untrue. 
and Councillor Whitney has two points of misrepresentation. No. Don't, Councillor Collier. Point of order. Just one moment, Councillor Cassie. I'll respond to the first one. <laughs> Councillor Whitney has two rights of reply. If Councillor Whitney would like to stand again and describe to me what she's offended about, I'm happy to direct Councillor Howard to withdraw. A point of order, Chair. Uh, um, Councillor Whitney might like to clarify that, but um, the exact words that Councillor Whitney used, you might like to consult the clerks that could assist you with this, was uh, that she wanted Councillor Howard to withdraw what she had just said because it was untrue and Councillor Whitney explained that she didn't call any councillors homophobes, she called members of the LNP. Yeah, I don't and she your... asked, and she asked Thank for you, that Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. I don't uphold your point of order. Councillor Whitney, your um, point of order. Yeah, do you, you've um, just asked. No, Councillor Cassidy. What I'm going to do is I want to hear from Councillor Whitney. You did before. No, no. Yes. Councillor Whitney. Yeah, you invited me um, before when, while talking with uh, Councillor Collier, um, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Cassidy, uh, to stand up and explain why I was offended. I did not call a single councillor in this room homophobic, and I asked Vicky Howard to, uh, Councillor Howard, sorry, to withdraw what she said. Thank you. Councillor Howard, you care to withdraw? I'm happy to withdraw. Thank you. Mr Chair. However, Mr Chair, I must say that calling anyone homophobic in this chamber without a skerrick of saying who is homophobic, labelling members of a political party as homophobic is disgusting. What we have... Just one moment, Councillor Howard. Uh, Councillor Whitney. Misrepresentation again. Thank you. Councillor Howard. We have many members of the LNP who are representative of the LGBTIQ plus community, many, many members. Many LNP members who are very proud, they march in the Pride Parade, they support each other, they support the LGBTIQ plus community. And to have people mysteriously labelled as homophobic is a disgrace. Now, through you, Mr Chair. Councillor Collier, do not. Through you, Mr Chair, I rise to speak about the Wynnum Fringe Festival, a festival that this council, the Schrinner Council, has supported since day one. Day one. Tom Oliver came into my office. We have, the, the Lord Mayor has supported everybody. Everybody has supported the amazing work that Tom Oliver does. And for for the Wynnum Fringe to be used as a political tool is a disgrace. So let me just say again, again, I'll take the interjection. The Leader of the Opposition using it as a fundraiser. Don't even know what that means. But, oh, there's more interjections. So, through you, Mr Chair, let me make this very, very clear. The Schrinner Council has supported Tom Oliver from day one. The Schrinner Council will continue to support Tom Oliver and the Win Wynnum Fringe Festival. We are immensely proud of the success of that festival and what it has done for the people of Wynnum. I know that Alex Gibney is one of Tom Oliver's strongest supporters. I know that Alex Gibney is, will march very proudly with the Bay Pride when they take to the streets of Wynnum. I will also like to put on record that the Pride people from Wynnum have been marching in Wynnum for, for a long time. This is the first official Pride event in Wynnum. But my goodness me, we've had some fantastic events at the Wynnum Fringe, and it's a very, very sad day when something such as this gets dragged into this, to this chamber. I'm just incredibly sad that Councillor Whitney sees it, sees it as her right to stand up and to label someone homophobic without even knowing who she's labelling. She says it's not one of us, thank goodness for that. But what I want to say to you, Mr Chair, and to the Chamber, and to anyone who's listening, 
that the Schrinner Council has supported Tom Oliver from day one and will continue to do so, and we wish the Wynnum Fringe Festival all its very best, including Bay Pride. Thank you, Councillor Howard. Just one moment, Councillor Massey. Councillor Whitmer, your three points of misrepresentation, yeah, please. Yes, so again, I did get up and clarify that I didn't send it, um, call a single person in this room homophobic. Um, I, or I, I, I take issue with the, uh, the fact that I'm refusing to um, uh, table things or name names, considering that uh, the other side of the chamber is very much calling about uh, no privilege in this place quite often. Um, and uh, I, I think it was just or mainly just about the fact that, um, yeah, they should probably talk to their candidate if they don't actually know anything that I'm talking about because she's very well aware of what's going on. Councillors, Councillor Howard, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Collier. Sorry, my apologies, Councillor Collier. It was Councillor Whitmy. Please accept my apologies, Councillor Collier. Councillor Massey. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on four items. Um, firstly, uh, to congratulate Valley Fiesta. Um, it was great to be there for the opening with Councillor Howard. Um, it was incredible to see the street closure again because it's been a couple of years since the street closure has been in place. And it was really amazing to catch up with so many friends um, like Dave from the Tivoli and the uh, Princess Theatre who programmed the event and also Chris, Ant and Mandy and the whole Q Music team who I'm um, very warmly connected to. So congratulations to the Valley Fiesta um, and hopefully it'll become bigger and better than ever in the future. Um, the second item I'd like to speak to is Out for Australia, Queensland Local Heroes, which is an event I attended just this weekend. Um, this event celebrated um, the Out for Australia Queensland winners, so I congratulate all those winners. And I also really thank them very, very deeply and personally for um, their storytelling on the night. Um, where they really, the winners opened up about their lives, their challenges, their achievements and the growth. Um, they're such wonderful heroes for the LGBTIQ plus community. And I thank them very much for um, the welcome of me and for their openness in sharing their stories with me. Um, thirdly, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, St. Mary's Kangaroo Point, who this Sunday celebrated their 150 year anniversary um, I really appreciate the thoughtful service. Um, there's a few reverends um, in Kangaroo Point and also in the Gabba that I've built close relationships with. So I really thank you for that invitation and sharing that celebration with me. Um, and also for the luncheon, the food was great. Thanks to all the volunteers that made that day happen. And lastly, I rise to congratulate Justice for Palestine, who put on the biggest protests this Sunday calling for ceasefire in Gaza. Um, I will see you again on the 12th of November. The protests continue across the city and will continue until ceasefire happens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any further speakers of general business? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I'm very pleased to stand and speak on behalf of the Administration Councillor about the wonderful Councillor King, who haven't even changed from Councillor King in my phone, but it's <laughs> Councillor Hammond. <laughs> who, like myself, is an 08 baby and joined the team when Campbell Newman got his majority in this place as well. Councillor Hammond has served on this team for 15 loyal years. It seems like yesterday, Fiona, I don't know where the years have gone. And she is one of the few, like myself, and I'm, I know on behalf of Councillor Wines who would love to have spoken today as well. Um, we have almost seen it all, I would think, in this place as well. Uh, three Lord Mayors, Newman, Quirk and now Schrinner, and the growth of our city at a very, very fast pace, and particularly the Marchant Ward over the last 16 years as well. But right from day one, and I so clearly remember meeting Fiona at a Women LN, uh, Liberal Party function as it was in the day, to very, very young 
uh, blonde girls going, what, 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 Wait, what are we thinking? We're running for what? And you're on the north side, I'm like, I have no idea where that is. And she's like, oh, I have no idea where Wishart is. Uh, but we uh, very, from the day one, the thing about uh, Councillor Hammond is she put her local community at the forefront of everything that she does. And it cannot be denied. And we heard from her there's an enormous list, some to call out of the bigger ones, the brand new library at Champside the massive upgrade of uh, Bradbury Park, the, uh, the fight and success of the upgrade of Murphy and Ellison Road, brand new parkland in Lutwich and many other places as her community grew exponentially as a principal regional activity centre. And she has held the state government to account on road projects around the Princess Charles Hospital, as well as exposing Mark Bailey's Band-Aid busway. And I'm sure she's gonna continue on that as well. So there has been a shopping list of deliverables and as we heard from Councillor Hammond, there was many of them and some she's extremely proud of. And I can rest assured for the people of Brisbane and for the people of Marchant that they absolutely got their bang for their buck when they voted in Councillor King in 2008 and continued with Councillor Hammond in 2016 and 20. It is crystal clear that whoever replaces Councillor Hammond in March at Ward is going to have massive and beautiful shoes to fill. <laughs> and obviously, as uh, Councillor Hammond has announced, that she will be nominating to go to another level of government in the future. We wish her the absolute best. We know we need people like Councillor Hammond in the Queensland Parliament. She has fought hard for her community. The status quo up there is not working and she will be a fantastic addition to a Christopher Lee government in the future. And we wish her all the very, very best. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Are there any further speakers in general business? Uh, Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak uh, about, I suppose, three, three events. Um, two past and one to come. Um, I'd like, first of all, I'd like to talk about the Diwali uh, festival down at Kingsworth Square uh, mm -hmm. last Friday. And um, it was uh, very challenging, of course, for the FICQ who pulled it all together. Anoop and uh, President Anoop and his, uh, his uh, leadership team um, were under great pressure because of the, the rain that actually happened um, um, Early, early afternoon or mid-afternoon, uh, and it looked like it was going to threaten to uh, uh, continue on. But uh, luckily enough, at, th at around about 6.30, when the formal um, uh, stuff was going to happen on the stage, uh, it cleared up and, uh, and it all went away, and it was uh, good for the rest of the evening, I believe. Anyways, um, it's, uh, I, know this, I think this is the 13th year they've uh, held it in the city here. Uh, I, remember, I remember one time that was, um, we had it up at Brisbane Square as well. They tried it up there once, I believe. I was there that night. And certainly King George Square certainly is the better, better venue. But of course, uh, when it's really a successful uh, uh, event, uh, which it, generally speaking is, of course, it, uh, the square sort of fills and of course, uh, it's uh, shoulder room only, actually trying to get around sometimes. So it's, uh, it's a very popular one. Um, FICQ fundraise uh, over the year to uh, be able to, uh, to fund it. Uh, it cost a lot of money and I just uh, put my hands, uh, put my um, uh, hands together to try to, and congratulate the uh, organizing committee uh, who's been doing this year after year after year after year. Um, our, um, I just also uh, want to say that uh, our uh, candidate uh, for Lord Mayor, um, Tracy Price, came along. Uh, she's come to a number of, uh, uh, of, uh, of events uh, f for the Indian community, and uh, she continues to uh, uh, build bridges and Honestly, the, the ladies especially uh, really want to uh, find out about her, and it's really uh, it's really pleasing to see that uh, uh, that many people from that community are uh, wanting to uh, have a, have a chat to uh, uh, potentially, and I think will be uh, our next uh, female Lord Mayor. Uh, now, moving on, um, I'd just like to also uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Uh, I've got a temple in my uh, ward on Constantine Street. Um, and it's, um, it's a Sri Lankan temple, and they have a school um, which uh, has been going for like 30 years. Now, this is a school that uh, meets uh, within the temple grounds. 
Uh, it's just about to expand their uh, their size as well uh, on a on a development within that uh, within that uh, within those grounds um, because it's been such a success uh, that there is well over 200 students that come along every Saturday and I believe uh, once the expansion goes through it'll be around about 250. So, um, but of course what what they do of course is that they uh, uh, try to secure the of uh, course the Shrank and mother tongue. Um, with the uh, generations to come. Um, I actually met the, uh, one of the uh, original students uh, for that, uh, at, that, uh, at that school, um, uh, which goes back 30 years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really good that they want to sustain their uh, cultural uh, ways, uh, whether it be singing or dancing or all those other traditional um, things that uh, that many of our cultural groups want to uh, continue on uh, so that their, uh, their children and grandchildren don't forget where they come from and, and they also retain that language as well, which is really important for Australia um, as well uh, because we are a multicultural community and we benefit greatly for, for that. Uh, for that, um, for that. Um, now, another one um, is about, as I say, it's about to uh, happen tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Now, this is the first time that I've actually um, was made aware of this particular one. I don't know how many years it's been going on, um, but it's the uh, community engagement um, of the uh, Young Environmental Leadership Network, um, uh, which is uh, happening. And the reason I became aware of it is because we have three students from St. John's who have been taking part in those meetings leading up to the uh, to the to the graduation, um, and I just like to give a big shout out shout out to uh, Clara Reed, um, Lily uh, Turner, and uh, and Sophie uh, Pham, who uh, undertake undertook that, that program, and uh, and of course uh, with the with their uh, with the direction um, and uh, encouragement of Maria McIver, who's the principal of St. John's, and that support teacher uh, Sharon Sharon Singh. Um, I look forward to catching up with the students tomorrow to find out uh, what actually occurred at all those five meetings that they, uh, that they attended, uh, just to see what, um, what uh, areas of uh, environmental uh, studies uh, uh, that they entail, because again, this is the first time that I was made aware of this particular program. So thank you, St. John's, for uh, uh, putting your hand up to try to encourage students to uh, look at the, our environment, which is very important, and I look very much forward to uh, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, bearing going through that one hour of traffic to try to get in through the congested uh, Western Freeway. But anyways, we'll get there, and uh, and I'm sure it will be very worthwhile. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Councillor Owen, you've got your hand up. You've got the call. I do, Mr. Chair. Thank, yeah. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to speak tonight in regards to Councillor Fiona Hammond, the outgoing Councillor of Marchant Ward, who has served in that role for by over 5,700 days, 15 and a half years. And I can recall when I first met Councillor Hammond, mm. and it was the very moment that she was handing in her nomination form to stand for pre-selection to, to run in the election as a councillor. And I can remember that day that she was there holding Piper in her arms, um, this little three-year-old girl, and there was something that clicked between us and it is built into a very, very strong friendship. Um, we have seen many changes in the last 15 and a half years and I know alongside our class of 2008 on our side of the administration who are still here in Councillor Adams and Councillor Wines that we had a very different election back in 2008 to the ones that take place today. Back in our first election, it was very much issue-based um, campaigning. It wasn't the, the nastiness, the vitriol, the personal attacks that seem to pervade into the chamber today. And that is a very sad reflection on some people. But I know that Councillor Hammond has always been true to her community. 
She has always been dedicated to listening to her residents. She has worked hard every single day of those 15 and a half years. We have both seen our children go from being little ones to being adults and being successful in their chosen um, professions and fields. And I think that coming from that perspective of raising children whilst in this job, it is very much a balancing act. And I don't think many people truly realise the sacrifice that families make, the sacrifices that our children endure, and the sacrifices that we as mothers make to not only balance the needs of the community, but also the needs of our families. And I do say as well that Councillor Hammond has been a very, very fierce advocate for many, many sporting organisations and also for many groups within her community. And I know she enjoys donning her Valley's Die Hards shirts and her brother's JRLFC shirts and also supporting warehouse cricket. But importantly, she has been there for her community. And I know we often have conversations when she's going to functions with the, the Northside Indian community. And we, we will have um, very much um, a conversation around these many events that take place on both the North Side and the South Side. And whilst you have developed Mayfair into a very successful event on the North Side, Councillor Hammond, I still believe that some of my events on the South Side um, can rival it. Uh, we have always had a North-South um, rivalry. Point of order. I think it's been a very healthy just point one of order. Just, just one moment, Councillor Owen. And it's also one that permeates right throughout the city as well. But I do commend you on the legacy that you have built in Marchant Ward from the Mayfair bringing people together. Point of order, Grand Mr Street Chair. Councillor Owen. And Councillor Owen, we have a point of order against you. <laughs> Councillor Hammond, your point of order. I think um, Councillor Owen has missed out on something very important. The north side is better, and we have two libraries, Councillor Owen. Oh. <laughs> Councillor Hammond, I don't uphold your point of order, hopefully for the last time. <laughs> Councillor Owen, you've got the call. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I, I knew when I got onto that north-south um, rivalry that there wouldn't be an ounce of holding back that, that Councillor Hammond would have to say something. But I just do say, um, in regards to your advocacy as well for Hearts of Purple, I know this is a cause that is very close to your heart and that you have strongly advocated for the team at Hearts of Purple. And um, all I do say to you is when you're out there going forward, don't pack the Mentos in your lunchbox because you don't need to be going to any more dentists um, after cracking a tooth on them in the chamber. But I know that you can walk away today and hold your head up high and be proud of what you have achieved because you have significantly made the Marchant Ward a better place for not only your local residents, but people right across our city of Brisbane. You have served the residents of Marchant extremely capably, competently, and in a way that they know that you have always been there for them. And you have served this city of Brisbane in your role as a councillor impeccably in the sense that you have always been true to our oath of office, that you have treated people in a fair, just and equitable manner in everything that you have done. So, my friend, it is sad to lose you from our chamber, but I wholeheartedly wish you every success in your next journey, and I will be there cheering you on in many ways, and you know that we will maintain our contact, um, remain friends, and from our first days sitting next to each other in this chamber, um, I believe we have a lifelong friendship. And I say to the people of Stafford, um, pick a winner, support Fiona Hammond in the next state election because she will serve you absolutely impeccably. 
Thank you, Councillor Owen. Are there further items of general business? Councillor Collier. Thanks, Chair. I'd like to speak on one item of general business today um, about Homeless Connect event that was held last week. Mm. This is an amazing council event, and it's only possible because of the support of not only council, and in this current climate, events like Homeless Connect should be getting more support, not less. Um, however, what I will say is that what makes this event really special is the way um, that communities can get involved. And I particularly locally want to acknowledge the Balimba Library for being a collection point, as well as um, the initiative from Tugulua Early Education, who actually um, did a donations drive. And it was amazing to be able to volunteer in the food store and see firsthand how those donations were making a difference. Um, Tracy Price and I volunteered all day in the food store. And to say it was um, a confronting experience is absolutely true. However, what I will say is that a lot of the people there were known to me as local councillor because they live in, in my community too. Um, so, you know, you can't make assumptions about where things like homelessness, housing insecurity, um, the most horrific domestic and family violence victims um, and their children as well. And to see their faces there, you know, getting support, um, it, it was deeply impacting to me. By the end of the event, um, the end of the day, in the food store, there only were a couple of items left, but we really did hand out most of the donations, which is quite confronting when you think about how, just how many pallets of basic items, like, you know, non-perishable food, toiletries, things like that, were handed out. And these, I can hand on heart say these, the people who, received them were so grateful. So many people were saying, oh no, I don't, I don't need to take that much. Leave it for someone else. Like they're, they're just, our friends are the most amazing, amazing people. Um, by the end of the day, yeah, we only had a couple of items left, like you know, tin spaghetti and bread, and these were given to the amazing service providers who were there and do this work, not just one or two days a year, but every single day of the year. Um, so events like these need more support, not less. I really do think it is um, an excellent event put on by council. Thank you, Councillor Collier. And uh, can I reiterate my apology before earlier in GB for calling you out in error? Further items of general business? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak about Diwali. On the north side of Brisbane on Saturday night, we celebrated with the Hindu Society of Queensland. I wanted to um, put my congratulations on record to Dr Jai Ram, uh, his family, his committee uh, and everyone that put in an amazing effort to organise what was a fantastic celebration of the Festival of Lights on the north side of Brisbane. Uh, it was an amazing celebration of culture, both traditional and modern. We had Bollywood meet the Sarod um, and that celebration of um, Indian culture and Hindu culture um, I remarked on the night was that something that makes our Northside community special and it makes our Northside community even more cohesive where we come together and celebrate what makes us interesting and what makes us a little bit different. And the central message of Diwali rang true that night, of course, as we sat down and um, celebrated over a meal together the triumph of light over darkness, of knowledge over ignorance and of good over evil, of course. Uh, and we could all use a bit of that around the world at the moment. So happy Diwali to everyone who celebrates. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Further items of general business? Councillor Murphy. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. I just wanted to um, also uh, join with other councillors in paying tribute uh, to Councillor Hammond's uh, 15 years of service to Brisbane City Council. Look, I, I, I won't take as long as some of the other speakers, uh, Councillor Hammond, but um, I, uh, you know, w when I was a new councillor in this place, uh, you were uh, definitely one of the first to um, uh, uh, to take me under your wing and to um, teach me uh, uh, a lot about how this place operates and about how to do this job. And I very much uh, have always appreciated that. I've enjoyed your bright and bubbly uh, demeanour. I've enjoyed your sick sense of humour uh, that you uh, in, do enjoy showing off in our party room on a regular occasion. Oh, um, no, but I, it is true. But just, I, just one moment, Councillor Murphy. Councillor Hammond. We do not know, we do not call out across the chamber. 
We do not and call out across the chamber. If you would like to speak to Councillor Murphy through the chair, please rise on a point of order. Councillor Murphy, you've got the call. And we can see, Chair, she's running it down to the wire, still getting in trouble in her final um, you know, minutes in this place. Uh, but um, look, I, I, I want to say, I think she's been brilliant for Marchant. I think she's been a tremendous advocate for that seat, a very, very difficult uh, seat for our side of politics to hold, not one that we expected to hold for a long time. And here she is, 15 years uh, later. What a, what a tremendous, successful uh, run. Councillor Hammond. The, um, all of the stuff with warehouse cricket is very true, and I know what a great advocate Lawrence Christie has been uh, of you and the work you've done out there over many years. Um, but we know um, you've been dedicated to many causes, and particularly uh, the cause of environment, not only uh, as a local council with all the different parks you've opened, and Bradbury Park, I think, being a crowning achievement of, of that. You know, but also uh, during your time as environment chair as well. Um, I will speak for him because he's not here. He's had to uh, rush away with a family emergency. But I, I know what a great friend you've been uh, to Councillor Wines in his time here. You two have had very much a, a symbiotic uh, relationship and you've supported each other uh, as good mates and as, as a boundary, uh, count, uh, councillors on the same boundary uh, through that time, as well as former uh, Councillor Wyndham uh, and Councillor Knapp as well, who um, I think, um, you know, I think uh, a little bit like me, you probably copped a little bit of bullying from her in your uh, first, <laughs> after 2008, which was, which was character building for you as it was for me. Uh, so just, we just, do, just one moment, um, Councillor Murphy. Can I caution you with your use of language because the former councillor is behind you? <laughs> I'm worried about that, Chair. I am worried about that. Um, I'll, have to get, I'll have to get an escort from your chair to the car park. Um, but, um, uh, and also Councillor Owen, I should say, as well. Uh, and she's made a, a tremendous contribution tonight. The, um, one of the biggest contributions, though, uh, that Councillor Hammond has made to our team is a steady stream of uh, policy liaison officers and uh, staff that seem to just come from her office uh, like a breeding ground, uh, always. Um, uh, we get good staff in the Marchant Ward office and then they get promoted into the Lord Mayor's office or into Chair's offices. So um, that's, a, that's weird. You seem to be the only office that does that with the regularity and the cadence that you do, um, Councillor. And I, I'm one of the beneficiaries of that, as are many other chairs. So um, we thank you for that. Uh, but I think, look, you've made an extraordinary contribution to your community, an extraordinary uh, contribution to your party, uh, and a magnificent contribution to your city. And I know that although we'll be losing a very effective councillor, uh, Neil and your kids will be gaining back a, um, a lovely wife and a loving mother. And um, I, I love those comments you made before. Those are comments that no other councillor in here would get away with. The ones about having the grandchildren, of course, as you know. <laughs> and and we, we know, uh, Chair, that in Marchant, the new councillor will indeed have some very, very big shoes uh, to fill in. And we will, of course, be assisting them in being up for that task. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Are there any other items of general business? Councillor Davis. Um, thank you, Mr Chair, and I really do feel the urge to say a few words um, about Councillor, uh, Councillor Hammond. I first met uh, uh, Councillor Hammond when I was in, a, in, in the State Parliament, and of course we would see each other from time to time at, at events uh, where uh, we, had, we had overlap. Um, what I will share with you tonight is uh, former councillor Amanda Cooper, uh, councillor Fiona Hammond and Tracy Davis MP uh, were always confused. Uh, none of us looked like each other, but we all had blonde hair. So we spent most of our life, we, we tired of correcting people saying, no, I'm Tracy or Fiona or, or Amanda. So in the end, we answered to anything. What excites me about your new venture, Fiona, is that when Amanda Cooper and Fiona Hammond are elected to the State Parliament yeah. in October yeah. next year, the three blondes will be back. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Sorry, you caught me mid-pritzel. Um, are there any further other f items of general business? Councillor Hammond. I know I'm pushing it, but I just want to say two things. Please. I know I'm pushing it. No, 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 no. you've okay. got the call. Oh, You've got the call. Uh, the clerks and the council officers, um, I failed to say thank you 
um, I did say thank you to the clerks, and you have to put up with a lot. When Campbell was here, we were here till one o'clock in the morning at times um, with his baby that he used to bring in late at night. We've had three fantastic um, Lord Mayors. Um, to the council officers, you have been absolutely incredible. Lex, who's retired, Ted, Alan Jarvis, um, there's so many of them to say. I'd like to thank you for your dedication to Brisbane. You certainly have made a great impact to our community um, and continue to do so with your dedication to our beautiful city. Um, <laughs> Councillor Davis, I can't wait to be called. I'm still councillor, right? You said Fiona. Until, until Friday, I'm still councillor. I'm going to hold on to that CR right to the end. But I look forward to continue being calling Tracy, Amanda, Fiona, and just answering the questions that they give and then giving you both a quick call to tell you what I'd said to them so we wouldn't get confused. Um, I forgot to um, thank um, Lord Ma uh, the previous Lord Mayors, Campbell Newman, Graham Quirk, and of course the current one, um, Adrian Schrinner. Um, thank you again for your time, your support. There's another lady I forgot to mention, and her name is Margaret DeWitt. Mm -hmm. Margaret DeWitt stood with me when I first started because I used to cross my legs, <laughs> put my head down as I spoke. Margaret took me under her wing and told me to put my head up and don't cross my legs any further, which if anyone knows um, Margaret DeWitt and Geraldine Knapp, you actually do what you're told. Yes. You, don't, you don't argue against those two ladies. I failed to um, recognise my campaign team who have been with me for 16 years. There's one of them up there, um, a, an amazing woman, Elaine O'Keefe. Um, thank you so much for your support over the many years. Dominic, I still can't look at you. Um, to my close friends, only because I'll cry when I say goodbye to Dommy. Um, to my close friends, thank you so much for your support and putting up with my tears and supporting me all the way through. The 2018, you had my back right from the beginning. It was a tough few years there. And without the team support through those years, I would like to thank you very much for standing by and helping me through. Of course, um, Tracy Davis, Councillor Tracy Davis has had many, many a teary phone call. Um, and I couldn't do this without you, Trace. And um, I really appreciate the friendship that we've had over the years. Um, Angela Owen, um, you and I have gone through a lot, both single parents at one stage together. Um, your dedication to the area has been absolutely amazing. This was mostly about saying goodbye to the council staff, so I'll be quiet now. Thank you. And I want to interrupt one more time so I can get warned again. My last warning. Councillor Hammond, your time has expired. <laughs> Are there any other items of general business? I declare the meeting closed unless Councillor Hammond wants to interject. <laughs> Thank you, councillors. Meeting's closed.